Good evening, everyone. In accordance with op the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is anyone here for public comment? First thing is the proclamation for National Night Out, uh, Night Off. And is there anyone right to the podium if you wouldn't mind stating your name? And we'll have Mr. Schultz, our clerk of the works over here, read that for you. Okay. Well, she want to read it. No, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> I was reading it going, that's a lot in there. <laughs> I can give you the gist of it. But I'm Ambro Jisco. I'm part of the um, K-12 action team for the community impact team here in North Reading. So we are proclaiming on March 13th, um, North Reading night off from five to eight o'clock, uh, five to nine, excuse me, here in town. Any Do you want more or? <laughs> uh, no, any board members have any questions or anybody want to get Maybe if you can explain more. to the community what that sure. entails. Sure, yep, yeah. so here in town what we're, um, this is our third or fourth year that we've done this, and what we've asked is that homework is lightened, activities have been um, somewhat canceled, and just sort of a night off for family members, um, people young and old, to just enjoy a night off. We have some restaurants in town that are offering specials as well, whether it's a discount or a free appetizer or something of the sort, so that families, if they want to go out together and enjoy a dinner, they can. If not, hopefully they can spend some time together at home. I, I think it's a great thing. Uh, I participated in my family uh, when my kids were home. Now they're yeah. <laughs> in college. And, uh, but I encourage the community to participate. I think yeah. it's great. And especially the uh, local venues around town run some specials those nights. Yeah. So it's nice. They uh, try to help out as well. I hope the public comes out and participates. So with that said, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll take the proclamation. Sure, Mr. Chairman, I move to proclaim Tuesday, March 13, 2018, to be North Reading Night Off and to read the following proclamation. And if I may, the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas the North Reading Community Impact Team works to identify factors that have a negative impact on the quality of life for all community members, from our young children to our senior citizens, and to implement solutions that solve the underlying problems. Whereas the North Reading Community Impact Team is a partnership between the North Reading Police Department, Youth Services, Elder Services, School Department, Parks and Recreation, Fire mm -hmm. Department, and the Board of Selectmen. Whereas North Reading is a busy, thriving town, but the Community Impact Team surveys show that time management and stress are a key factor impacting North Reading families. Whereas studies show that children and teens and families who eat dinner together frequently have lower incidence of drug and alcohol use. And it is the goal of the North Reading Community Impact Team to support healthy relationships and strong communications within families. Now therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of North Reading, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim March 13, 2018 to be North Reading Night Off. We urge all town departments, committees, community organizations, sports leagues, and businesses with regularly scheduled activities for students or families to spend all activities beginning at 5 p.m. on March 13, 2018, so that all North Reading families, young and old, can unplug and slow down to spend important time together, enjoying a meal, conversation, and unpressured family time. And that would be, if approved, will be signed by Michael Prisco, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Second. I have the proclamation motion and a second. Any more discussion? Does that mean we get the night off? We get the night off. With pay. <laughs> With pay. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you for coming in. Mr. Chairman, we'll need your signature on that. Um, you know, I've... We were running a little bit late when we got started, and I had planned to do something, but we seemed to catch up a little bit on time. So I hope um, the people in attendance tonight uh, don't mind, but I'd like to take a moment uh, tonight just to have a quick moment of silence for the police officers in Ohio that were shot and killed this week. And uh, just to mention that, you know, we've had 11 officers shot this year in the first six weeks of the year. That's a lot, and I think as, um, you know, the public, we should just take notice of that and our appreciation for all our public safety officers. 
So I'd like to take a moment of silence uh, for them and their families to think about their families. Thank you. I appreciate you giving me that opportunity. So, with that said, we have a 745 joint meeting, so I thought maybe we could touch upon the cable advisory committee review while we wait to get into that 745 meeting. Is that possible? Mr. Gilbert? We can certainly attempt to. I know that uh, Ms. Reddington is here and can speak to where I think things stand. Try yes. to take advantage of the extra time, get you home to your family a little earlier. Uh -huh. you don't mind? Ah, nice. <laughs> well, half of it. You can sit right there at that microphone. Sure. Um, I have a presentation. Oh. I don't know if, if you could give it to the town administrator. Put it on the computer for you. Moving. Um, my name is Kerry Reddington. I'm a member of the Cable Advisory Commission. Um, we are a, uh, an advisory board that uh, assists the Board of Selectmen with respect to the licenses for the two current cable operators, Comcast and Verizon. Um, so the Comcast, both the Comcast and Verizon agreements are up for renewal this year. So the Cable Advisory Committee has been uh, working with um, some of the selectmen uh, and with the op cable operators to negotiate renewal licenses. Uh, cable services are regulated by both federal and Massachusetts law. And under such laws, the town has to provide a license to the, uh, to the cable companies. The license is granted by the Board of Selectmen. Um, last time the cable, thank you, last time the cable license with Comcast was renewed was back in 2008. It was a 10 year license agreement. And there were a few key terms under this license agreement whereby the town required Comcast to provide public educational government access channels um, through which you have such services as the um, this meeting, the Board of Selectmen meeting, other um, community programming. Um, the PEG access also provides for other services in the community, um, access to, um, to classes to learn how to operate the equipment and edit film and things of that nature. Um, so the, this PEG access is, is supported by the cable companies through franchise fees and capital contributions. The franchise fees and the capital contributions are passed through to the, cap, the cable operator subscribers. Um, another part of this 2008 license was to support and maintain the Comcast-owned institutional network called the INET. Uh, the INET provides for, is a fiber optic cable system that connects the municipal buildings within the town and the schools and over which the PEG access programming is transmitted and it goes back to Comcast and Verizon to be broadcast. Um, we also, as the town of North Reading, had used this INET for the transmission of data, um, which technically may or may not be part of the cable system, but um, that's a, a whole other can of worms, to say the least. So in connection with the renewal of the Comcast license, could you skip ahead to the next thing? Thanks. Um, in connection with the renewal of the Comcast license, the North Reading Cable Advisory Committee reviewed the needs of the town and PEG access going forward, which is the ascertainment. This included a review of the performance under the 2008 license by Comcast, a survey of North Reading residents, which was done um, through a paper survey and online survey as well. 
Um, we had discussions with the PEG access operator, NORCAM, and we held public hearings. So based on this ascertainment, the Cable Advisory Committee determined that the renewal license should include the continuation of the PEG access pro programming, and we thought that it would be prudent to increase the franchise fees and additional cap capital contributions from the cable operators in order to maintain the funding of NORCAM going forward. Uh, as a committee, we also requested the continuation of the INET. Uh, the cable operator, however, uh, is not inclined to, uh, to continue the use of the INET, which we'll get into, but it was a, a big uh, point of contention within the negotiations, and I will say that we tried very hard and, and uh, also got the advice from Bill Hewig, uh, the town council, with respect to the use of this, this system going forward. Um, however, so after the negotiations, we, uh, we, as the Cable Advisory Committee, would recommend that we sign the license, uh, which increases the franchise fee from 4.25% to 5%. This is the maximum amount allowed by law. Um, that is a percentage of Comcast gross annual revenues and uh, is, is payable to the town quarterly uh, over the 10-year period. We also uh, would recommend the capital contribution from Comcast of $150,000, and that would be payable to the town with 10 equal annual installments. Um, and that could be used for <coughs> other uh, services to Comcast in addition to the PEG access uh, programming, it could be used for things such as capital improvements, purchase of new equipment, and, and other items. Um, with respect to the INET, Comcast declined our request to continue to utilize this fiber optic, fiber optic network for the transmission of data, and Comcast indicated that going forward, the network could only carry the PEG access pro programming content. Uh, and my last slide. The town relies upon the INET currently, again, to transmit data between various departments in a secure manner, thus losing the INET does have a negative impact on the town. Uh, however, we were able to negotiate a two-year transition period, during which time the town may continue to utilize the INET for both PEG channel programming and this bi-directional data transmissions. Following the two-year period, Comcast will decommission the INET, and in consideration, Comcast will pay North Reading $75,000. This amount is payable within 60 days and will not be passed through to Comcast subscribers. 60 days from when the license is signed. So there's actually, there's a license and then there's a separate INET um, side letter agreement. So they should be signed contemporaneously and then 60 days from that date. So the replacement for the INET is underway now? It's, it's before the Capital Committee for consideration. Uh, it's something that we've been talking about now for the last you know, couple of years anyway. Um, <clears throat> we were not totally unaware as to the um, luxury that we've been enjoying for the last 18 years of uh, being able to uh, utilize it. Uh, the last contract and the previous contract were pretty much silent in relation to whether we could or could not, but the uh, interpretation and federal regulations have changed so that the provider does not necessarily have to provide us that type of access any further. That being said, we, um, the town has to address the situation. So um, we're, as you're well aware, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we're seriously considering you know, building our own INET. Uh, it's going to take us, um, the appropriation will come up in the next coming fiscal year, It'll take us a little bit of time to, to get it up and running. Uh, during the course of negotiations with Comcast, uh, we stressed upon them. They initially wanted to give us six months. We said that wasn't realistic based upon budgetary constraints and how we appropriate our money. And then we still then have to go out to bid, and there's a whole host of uh, hurdles that uh, public bidding laws require. Um, they listened, they went to 12 months, and now they're at 24 months. So, uh, so we have enough time to adequately appropriate, determine how we're going to move forward with the uh, construction of a new INET that we will manage and uh, give us time to decommission the other one. Do you have a range? In addition to that, there ranges to when? Cost. 
cost we're talking what I yeah, believe the pending request is four hundred thousand dollars but uh, it may be uh, <coughs> We're, hope we're, review, we're reviewing the scope of the school department to, concern, to confirm we have all the buildings and equipment addressed. Uh, and again, in consideration for um, for that, uh, Comcast is offering us seventy-five thousand dollars, which will not be passed through to the subscribers. It will come from their home home office rather than a pass-through. Uh, uh, as a remuneration to assist us in meeting our goal to get off of it. Mr. Gilbert, I misspoke, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to look at the finance director. It's less than four hundred thousand dollars. I had three fifty in my head. Three twenty, three twenty-five, three fifty. Between three hundred thousand and three fifty, yeah. um, right. we are making sure that we have included every possible location that's necessary. Within <coughs> we talked about in CIPC different ways of doing it and yes. what's more efficient. And those funds would be raised and appropriate, and appropriate, or um, most likely they would be bonded. It would be bonded. It would be a five-year. And does um, Norcam invest in this at all? Will they invest in it? No, they, they this, is for, this is for data. Okay. For us. It's for so the town. No, no money from the NORCAM can be, yes. But so the NORCAM will be using the new yes. network. Right. So they're not going to invest in it? We can't use any of their funds? So uh, under the provision of the license that we have with them right now, uh, in effect right now, they are offered access to the bidirectional uh, mm -hmm. network. And that condition is unlikely to change in a future agreement. However, we may choose to modify the agreement accordingly. But they effectively have a license to operate on it as part of the condition that they exist under right now. So this, we would be replacing the INET with this new network yes. to be constructed. And that, that was a strategic choice, I think, on, on our part that um, I think many of us involved in the discussion felt it was a lesson learned from some of the difficulty we had with Verizon relative to our um, radio communications and then um, also with this is issue itself and being beholden to a third party. Um, we felt that INET is our licensee, they are operating as our cable access corporation and we would make available to them our institutional yeah. network. But we also know that that's generated half a million dollars in money in, the, you know, in some of their... Yes, Mr. Messier. There, there was a, an option that we decided against and that was that let the INET stay in place and only do cable TV on it. And we could go to uh, putting high-speed internet in all the buildings and buy the appropriate equipment and set up VPN tunnels to communicate between them. And, you know, that resulted in, you know, annual maintenance costs, annual uh, replace, not necessarily annual, but because of security concerns and things, paying for security licenses, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, when you look at this, this is an investment you make, and then the, INET, uh, the new INET or whatever you want to call it is, is going to last a long time. Uh, Matt has had communications with uh, a vendor that is on the state bid list, and uh, you know, based on what I've heard, I'm pretty comfortable that it's more than... It, you know, I would give it the highest priority in terms of going in that direction. Uh, the cost number has been a little bit all over the place, and uh, I think having that window of cost is a good idea as we really get closer to uh, you know, actually taking real action and, and putting numbers together and maybe even going out to bid, even though there is a, uh, it is, uh, there is a vendor, at least one on the state bid list. Mr. To address your question for the future, um, right now the structure that we have in place calls for the town to receive funding from Comcast and Verizon for cable access related purposes, which in turn are used by NORCAM to um, both uh, operate and then also to make capital investments. That doesn't preclude us from in the future stipulating that a portion of those proceeds that come to the town could be made available to offset maintenance or other costs. I'm not committing to that at this point, but that, I think that is an avenue that could be available to us as we look to I negotiate a new explore. license That's agreement. Because yeah. we want to, we do this, we want to do it right, and we want to make sure we have the ability to maintain it for, forever. Okay. May I interject, actually, so just to clarify, the only, we could not use the franchise fee, the 5%, to fund that um, right. capital expenditure, but you could use the capital contributions. Yep. And we, the NORCAM does have um, some capital contribution money set aside within their, their accounts. Okay. This is 
Then you build. So the, the increase in the franchise fees, we could have used that to maintain the connectivity that we're assuming in, in this contract. In other words, that additional amount that we're going to be receiving that gets passed along to Northam. It looks like here um, the town is the town is going to supply the connectivity to peg access under this arrangement. The town, yes. So we can't use any part of that franchise fees to maintain the connectivity? Well, so we're assuming we have to restructure right? if we want to. That contract with Noah Camp is up this That's <coughs> correct. Once we oh, get through okay. negotiating with Verizon, we, we then negotiate again with Noah Camp. And I think to Ms. Reddick's <coughs> point, the portion that we would be able to use against the INET would be only the capital portion, not Correct. the annual right. recurring franchise yep. fee. So there's two components of, there's actually three components of funding in this contract. The annual operating revenues, which is the 5%, the capital intended for, for cable only at $150,000, and the capital intended for INET only at $75,000. It's important to realize that the capital amount is $150,000, basically $15,000 a year for 10 years, you know, and so who knows what technology is going to look like, you know, three years from now, mind five and 10 years from now. We thought it was important to uh, provide Norcam or whoever our vendor is uh, enough resources to move with the times and uh, keep up with the equipment changes uh, okay. going forward. Got it. Any other questions? Just comment. Go. Cable Advisory Committee. Ed Strokes down sunning himself in Florida, but Ed, Kerry, Gill, Steve, who else is here? Michael. Michael, Michael uh, have done a terrific job as far as uh, shepherding this thing through, and uh, uh, Bob and I spent a little bit of time with them, well, maybe a little bit, a little more time than we thought we were going to spend with them, um, <laughs> you know, to get this thing done, and uh, Jane you. was in Lyman, who, who just retired from Comcast. I want to uh, acknowledge her efforts in getting this thing done uh, just before she retired, before the end of the year. Uh, but a lot of effort, a lot of discussion back and forth, uh, a little bit uh, strained at times, uh, but uh, a good ending uh, all the way around. And I uh, want to applaud uh, Comcast for working with us to get our INET, give us enough time to get uh, our own INET up and running. So, well, thank very good. Thank you to everyone for making the commitment in your schedules to do this. And, and they're not it's done very important. because we're starting with Verizon mm -hmm. yesterday, I guess. Yeah, that'll so. be easy. It will be easy. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good. I think we'd like to get some money from Verizon to help pay for the new line at too. I'm, Whether or not we're I'm sure going to be successful be, uh, is I have remains to be that. seen. I do. I have confidence that it'll be there. Okay. Any other questions? I think we have a motion. Yes, we do. Mr. Chairman, I move to sign the license agreement between Comcast and the Town of North Reading for the period beginning January 5, 2018 through January 4, 2028. Second. Okay. I got a motion, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Again, thank you. Thank you, thank you very Thomas much. Thank you. Okay, so we, I believe we have copies of the agreement here to be signed. I, I don't know, Ms. Wright, if you want to leave them with us and we'll yeah. return them to you that. tomorrow. Okay. Um, and, and I apologize, but I might I might mess you guys up on your thing. There's also a, um, there's the two side letter agreements. One is the side letter for the INET agreement, and uh, there's another side letter that basically is, it says if if Comcast offers HD channels in the future going forward, um, then they also have, um, we, we may also get that. And that's actually nothing that we need to sign. It's just a, a letter that Comcast will present to us. Uh, but the other, the INET side letter agreement is another agreement. So I just want so to make sure that we you need have. need a motion? Yes. I would say so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Um, oh, if Mr. Did, Schultz did, could uh, substitute a you did, Comcast did. license yeah. agreement for a yeah. side letter. Yeah. Several. Could you do that, Mr. Schultz? Um, okay, move the side, uh, sign the license agreement and side letter. No, no. just do a separate just, motion. Yeah. Just do a separate motion side letter. to um, move to approve, si the side approve the side letter. Mr. Chairman, between I have Comcast and the town. I move to approve the side letter between Comcast and town of North Reading for the period beginning January 5, 2018 through January 4, 2028. Second. Motion and a second by Mrs. Minipelli. Any discussion? Any modification we need? Mr. Gilberto, I think we captured it. You did, yes. Any more discussion? We're good. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous.
<laughs> All right. You want to be in HD? The poor viewers. All right. Um, thank you. And um, I'm sorry for the folks that the joint meeting with the CPC. We talked about 102 Low Road. Thank you for allowing us to have some flexibility uh, to move some things around. But we can get into that discussion. Do we need to? We don't need to sign those tonight. Uh, uh, we'll sign like them at that. the end of the meeting. Mr. Chair, that's okay. We don't need to hold uh, on this right. We have a presentation for this next one. Uh, I have the word document which I can put up on the screen there. If you wouldn't I mind, I just wanted to note one thing. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to coordinate a quorum of the Community Planning Commission. Uh, we do have two members that are here this evening. Uh -huh. They will consider uh, formal action on this matter at their next meeting on February 20th, I believe. But uh, I want to thank um, Danielle and. Bill and Chris are making time this evening to come meet with us, and Fran DeCost, who's here as well, has advised the Economic Development Committee. If I could ask a favor of the four of you to come up to the front here where this microphone is, and that way if we have some questions, we can have a nice conversation, and the folks at home can hear. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you. Fran, how are you? So the folks listening at home, we have our CPC members here this evening and uh, also our consultant from TRA Associates, Mr. Fran DeCoste. And the discussion tonight is, as everyone knows, we've, uh, we were successful in executing the transaction of 104 Lowell Road over to Poultry Homes for the new Mountain Martins Landing project. So now we're getting ready and get started to go out again for the second time with the RFP for 102 Lowell Road, which is about 2.5 acres of land that's remaining on the east side of the property. And uh, so I'll turn it over to the town administrator to get things going. So we have copies of the RFP uh, in its draft form, uh, reflective of the comments received from the Economic Development Committee at a meeting two weeks ago, and reflective of comments from Fran DeCoast, who is our Broker and uh, John Eichmann, who also reviewed this, I believe, last week. Um, I, I think maybe at this point, it's best to turn over to the town planner to describe kind of where, where we stand and what the high points are of uh, this document. And what we're asking for is a consensus and agreement from this board and also from the planning commission as well prior to yep. issuing it. Okay. So, do we, Mr. Chairman, to the town planner? Yes. This is McKnight. Actually, I think I'm going to have uh, Fran talk about the changes oh, that we'll he just made. We're the tonight. I like <laughs> it. Yeah, that's good. That's um, how it flows, Fran. It's it's <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Fran DeCoast from uh, TR Advisors. Good to see everybody tonight. Um, so what we did, um, just a little background, if you all recall, we, we did uh, put an RFP out for this property um, about this, this time last year. Um, and uh, some of the you know, main business terms of this was that uh, we restricted to use, the use to one in commercial uses. Um, and uh, I, I think um, in the, in the other thing was we made uh, space, part of our deal with Pulte was that they were gonna create an easement to allow for um, wastewater treatment um, on the parcel that they, had, uh, they were planning to buy. Um, also at that time, you know, the, the deal with Pulte was sort of in its infancy and, you know, there's still a lot of, a lot of um, uncertainty of whether it was gonna move forward, which thankfully it did. Um, so we did not receive any proposals uh, on, that, on that RFP and we decided to table it. Um, let, let's, you know, see how the, the Pulte deal um, ironed out and then, you know, look at it down the road. So here we are down the road. Um, over the past six months or so, I have been approached by interested parties um, for, for different uses. Um, uh, some storage companies um, were, were interested, but uh, I believe it's not allowed by the zoning here. Um, and- uh, By the way, we're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> Just that in case you're wondering. That makes it easy, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, over the last four or five months, I've been talking to a restaurant um, uh, company that is interested in the site. They have a sort of a unique proposed use where it's a restaurant um, and it uh, also includes an adult. I actually don't even know if it's, I shouldn't say adult. It has a sports uh, recreation component to it. So, um, 
you know, and they're very interested in the area. They've laid the site out for what they, what they would like to do, and they've expressed interest in, in proceeding with buying the site. So, um, you know, always the trick in these, these RFP processes is, you know, it's always good to know if there's somebody else that's interested in it. So we're in, a, we're in a good position to put it out in the market. So um, what, what I did was I took uh, the, the previous RFP and I marked it up. And what we provided to you is a, a, the red line compared to what we actually put on the street uh, last time. So um, there's some very minor changes, um, but more, you know, most importantly is we could say that there is a 450-unit uh, development that's happening in front of the site, um, which can really answer a lot of the questions of what's going to be there down the road. We didn't have those certainties back a year ago. So we've, we've changed that. Um, we were able to uh, eliminate Excuse me, friend. Uh, a zoning. Friend, if you could, while you're doing this, if you could just give us the page number you're sure. on so we can just track with you. Perfect. And I think Mike's putting it up. So on page four. Thank you. Um, it's hard to see on, on the changes on the red line changes. Sort of the red line's on the left hand side. Yeah. Um, so that's the section where we sort of described what was approved there. Um, and then on the next page, page five, uh, we eliminated, uh, there was a restriction in the office, industrial office zone that um, <coughs> had, a, had a, a minimum 50,000 square feet of building space um, for any type of retail use. So that was changed in um, the pre, the, uh, was the uh, Marsh Special Town Meeting. So we removed that, that uh, language there. Um, on page six, this is sort of uh, probably the biggest change here in where in the previous RFP, we had offered an easement on what would be the Pulte's land. And that was a re requirement of the sale to Pulte that they accommodate that. Um, as we work through the sale to Pulte, the <coughs> wastewater disposal area was actually carved out of the sale to Pulte. And um, that parcel was retained by the town, town of North Reading. So what we, what we, we um, discussed through the, through the um, Economic Development Commission was that the town would retain that parcel, but provide an easement to the uh, proposer of approximately 110 feet by 70, 275 feet um, on that lot. We call it lot A1B. Um, it's a lot that has a no-build restriction, but we can allow for either wastewater disposal or parking, surface parking. Um, or both. Or both. Or both, depending on the thing. So um, that's, that's a twist in what we had before, just a different, different <coughs> way to, to package it. Um, also, I think it's important to add in this section that uh, we're going to have to add this, and this sort of came up after we drafted this, was there could be a potential license uh, to Pulte for a temporary um, uh, electrical uh, line uh, to go underground in the parcel. So, um, but it was for one year, Mike? That's correct. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Pulte Homes has contacted me to uh, inquire about the ability to put that temporary service in place, and it would run from where the uh, existing utilities are along Lowell Road, through the shared access drive, and uh, ultimately through what is still town-owned land to Pulte's uh, construction trailer slash office on the space. And their desire is to do it through underground conduit. So we've been working with them on the terms of a license um, that would uh, potentially be approved. I understand that they are also considering just doing the traditional overhead wires for such a connection as well, but I think we're all hopeful that it could be through underground <coughs> utilities. So. The property will be temporarily encumbered by uh, that license, but I, I don't believe, Fran, that, and I'll, I kind of look to you, that it would be a substantial encumbrance in terms of the work to be done at the site. Yeah, I think if you, um, if you look at you know, the timing of what it would take for someone to go through an approval process and uh, build their site, um, I, I think um, they could work that out so that they could work around that type of encumbrance. <coughs> and it's something that you know, we'll, we'll, we want to disclose it and we can deal with that through, uh, through the RFP process. If we discover through, um, through the process, through questions and answers, 
that there's an issue there, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to address it. But well, how long is Pulte anticipating having the trailer there? I would think four or five years. No. The, no. the the proposed license is for one year. One Mr. Chairman, one at a time, but. Mr. Chairman, through you. So my understanding of their construction plan, and they will be here February 26 to tell us in more detail. Uh, but my understanding is that uh, their intention is to have their office building in the first um, condominium building uh, open the, uh, later on this year. And presuming they'll be connected to permanent power source at that point in time, they wouldn't yeah. need this location. Excellent. Yeah, that's the plan. Great. The permanent one by then. Okay. Um, Please continue. Okay, so um, what we've done here is this RFP, uh, the time frame and the dates go throughout it. Uh, I have it basically to go out towards the end of the end of the month, with sort of a six-week time frame. Um, we we sort of have someone that's hard to trot on it, and um, if we if we do and find that um, through the process we think there is a need for more time to have it on the street, then we can always uh, extend the. Uh, the due date for the RFP proposals. Um, we did, uh, the only other sort of housekeeping thing we did is we did change the plan in the, uh, in, in the, uh, we had an addendum uh, uh, for page 22 where we added, so you can see uh, the, uh, the lot A1B, that's the, that's the uh, A&R plan where we carved it out to get an idea um, what, what where we're offering this easement. Mr. Masseri. Just a comment, and I may have missed it, but you know, you added note that there's 450 over 55 condos going in. You should also mention Lincoln Properties and the apartments that are there too. Yeah, yeah 406 units. There's 406 apartments already in that property. Already there. Yeah. Um, and have been there for a while. <laughs> Let me just see. Okay, we can add that in. We'll add that into the uh, property description section on page yeah. four. Thank you. Good suggestion. Mrs. Minipelli. Just a, a date thing, I think, maybe. There might be a correction on page three, and they're due in April, but on page seven, they're due in March, so that could be a little, just a little. When they do, the do, they do in. Yes. Thank you. Oh, that, that one. No, no, it's a, it's a mistake I made. <laughs> I'll own up to my mistake. No, that's, <laughs> that's, no, that's why we're looking it over. So. Yeah. No, I should have caught that. That's perfect. No, that's all right. Table top, I think, is the right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Mr. Mis Mr. O'Leary, sorry. Uh, just, Fran, in this proposal, um, we're not looking to go wide open, see what the market will bring, because so what we did for the last one, we're being a little more restrictive. The the the, uh, the the last proposal for this 102 lower, we we restricted it to commercial uses. I understand that, but uh, but what we did for 104 was a little different. Well, yes, definitely a little bit different, well, well, it, which yielded a little different uh, uh, results. Yes. As far as um, during the course of your discussion with in your contemplation things uh, with the EDC and anybody else you were talking to, would you not recommend saying that the town would consider proposals that would require a zoning change if the proposal fits what the town thinks is in its best interest as we did before? And if so, we're not seeing it. <laughs> and if not, why not? If I go. So the first time we put this out, if you recall, <clears throat> we had this discussion. The Economic Development Committee made a recommendation to the board. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No. The first time we put this RFP out, we came to the board, we made a recommendation, and the majority of the board agreed that we would focus primarily on the commercial side and try to uh, put an emphasis on commercial in this RFP because we had so much uh, residential now going in. 
and and that's that was the approach back then. So this was discussed. In matter of fact, from the Economic Development Committee standpoint, it was a six to one in favor of that approach. There was one member that felt strongly that we should leave it open, but we felt that we've accomplished so much residential over there to have an emphasis on commercial. We would we'd like to do that with a small parcel. So that's that's what was brought forward to the Board of Selectmen and the CPC, and the majority agreed that was the approach. I just think that. Uh, we kind of learn by experience sometimes and that uh, the marketplace out there will dictate what the value of the property is and then the proposals will come in and we may ultimately determine you know that that's what we want to do based upon the proposals but I've just uh, as I advised suggested a while ago you know let the market dictate what the property is worth and then uh, we can pick and choose it that way we'll have more choices let's put it that way no, we, there's no doubt we'll have more choices, but again, the Economic Development Committee put forward that they're suggesting that we focus on a commercial opportunity in this area and no residential, and that's why we're limiting it. Yes, it does limit us from maximizing the value of the property, but I think we did pretty good in the first go around, and I think what we try to accomplish here is to meet our mission, which is to increase, to try to bring some more commercial touches to that local area. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I'd just like to, to remind folks that when you put an RFP out there right now and you open it up to everybody, commercial is not going to come into that. It's only going to get residential. That's, that's just what's going to happen. I mean, it happened, basically happened um, at 104. We had only one, one non-residential non, uh, non uh, proposal. Um, which yes, it did. Yes, it did come in much lower, um, and we all agreed that what we did was the thing to do at the time. I, I think opening the other two and a half acres up right there to more residential, just to make a little bit more money, is a it's short sighted. Let's let the commercial property make their money going forward, and what they can do for the town there. And that, it, you know, restaurant right there, they've got, I can't see them doing wrong. They're gonna have, they're gonna have their clientele right there. They'll walk over, they won't even drive in the good weather. That's what I would do. So, that's my feeling. I don't know any other board member feels, but. Yeah, I, just to follow up on that, you have between Edgewood and, and Pulte Homes, you're gonna have about 2,000 people that can walk to this. And I think given the small, slice of this parcel, about two acres or so, I think it should complement the resi big residential area we have right Not, I think adding more residential there is just not the way to go with that particular piece, especially being on a main road too. You, you know, we need more commercial options. When, when this was brought up before as well, and I believe Mr. DeCoste, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, it would actually be a deterrent for commercial property um, developers to even consider this property if you're gonna open it up. They just won't even bid on it because they know they just cannot compete with a residential offer on this property. But I'll leave, leave it to you to clarify. Yeah, I, I believe in this current market, a residential um, use would definitely yield a higher value. Um, so you, you, it could chill bids from, from other, other uses. Because it, it, it takes time to put these uh, proposals together. And if you're you know, develop, developing something and you're looking and saying, well, I can offer this, they can offer five times this. Why am I gonna go through, I'll go look for another deal. Okay. Any other inputs? Again, I just think that, uh, and again, I, and I think we can put an emphasis in the RFP that we're, we'll be leaning heavily towards commercial development, but we consider Others just to see what uh, see what comes in, see what the marketplace would uh, would bear, and again, maybe a combination of the two. Again, I agree it's a small parcel, two and a half acres, uh, but you've got the additional ancillary parking across the way, and uh, <coughs> I thought maybe we would have learned a little bit from, you know, let's let's see what it is, and I, I would think if uh, as friends talking to people, um, and as they do the walkthrough. That you know would appear to us that a commercial 
uh, development would complement the area, but we're willing to consider other proposals. If someone's going to be a little creative with it, um, why limit it? And, uh, I, I think uh, the last go around we had the same discussion where we didn't want to consider the, the residential, and finally we did at the last minute. Um, it certainly bore a lot of fruit. Uh, so let's see what see what they propose. Uh, so we did talk about this last time, but the, in the when we offered on the 102 level, the small apostle, we did not open it up. So and we went. We had a lot of conversations about this. Um, about what do we get? We got the we got the commercial use only. Well, the, but what did we get for proposals? I don't recall. Can you? We don't. We didn't get any. Right. We didn't get any. Well, the main reason is. No one knew what was going to happen with 104 at the time, and I think we have a, it's a completely different picture over there now. But again, I think, Mr. O'Leary, you've made your point pretty clear. I don't want to try to rehash it over and over. I'd like to try to make a decision to move forward. I think you're very clear. And if any other board member feels the same way, I mean, it's a majority rules here. Um, you know, if, I don't know, Mr. Masseri, how you feel about it, or Mr. Schultz and Mrs. Mignapelli, but I'm we have to make a decision. What's being proposed by the Development committee. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a perfect. Uh, that's why I asked to make sure you put in the other yeah. 406 apartments. I mean, yeah. you know, a long time ago we talked about a, a restaurant, and it would seem to me that there are some things that would support the, those two develop community developments that would be beneficial. Uh, if we get less money than we would if someone built some more apartments. I could care less at this point. I think that that would be very helpful in the area there. And I may be wrong, but that's how I feel. Well, and I, I think we should give it one more shot. And if we get no bids, then oh, I, I, I think we're no left doubt, with no other There's no doubt option. we're going to get bids. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, if they've got a ready-made uh, book of business there. Like I say, you've got 2,000 people sitting there. Uh, why not? You know, so. Mr. Schultz. I just think we also have to watch drain on pop or, uh, population growth being too far too fast and potential drain on schools. I think if we start putting residential in there, I think we run the risk. I mean, Pulte Homes worked out because over 55. Presumably will not drain the schools, but I just, you know, we just built schools. We don't want to build new ones 10 years from now because we've doubled the population. I think we need to kind of keep that in check as well. This has been your pillow. And I, mean, I would tend to agree with Selectman O'Leary that maybe, but I don't know that if there's a way to write it that, you know, no thank you to residential because you want to see what someone can like you said creatively propose and you see a lot of these smaller you know retail residential type of um, buildings that would be nice there but I, I'm, I'm on the fence because I think we're under such a short timeline that you're going to know and we also have the discretion to say no to anything that comes forward if we want to try something more broad but I, I would tend to agree that y you might get something you're not we're not even considering c could possibly be proposed there that is better than anything we're thinking of right now so which is what happened I was which is what I think happened by opening it up or broadening the last one I'm on I'm I'm, I'm on the fence though because I I do recall we had a lengthy discussion about this and wanting to sort of draw in more business is a big goal that everyone has, so. I'd like to get the sort of sentiment from the CPC members that are here, if you could, if you wouldn't mind, give me your thoughts. I mean, yeah, we definitely had many conversations about opening up the RFP um, last time at the EDC meetings. Um, and I think, you know, we did hit a home run with, with 104, and, and I think 102, Commercially, I think is probably the best use for that, that chunk of land right there. You get so much residential around it um, to be able to have something commercial right there uh, would be great. I think you know more what you're talking about would be great on 28 with with the uh, retail above, stores below. That'd be a great area for that. This is kind of out out there, and um, I think some kind of commercial use. It either be a restaurant or you know whatever, whatever they come up with. I think would be very <laughs> yes, I, I agree with Mr. Bellavance that I, you know, using that property for 
or at least putting it out there again. Now that we've got Pulte Homes in full swing, it's it's I think it's going to wake up uh, the commercial interests um, and bring in a, res uh, a restaurant or some. I mean, there's already a, a somebody interested in it with a, a restaurant sports complex thing going on. Um, but other people may come out with different ideas for restaurants, something else, or you know, something to, to uh, energize that little bit of commercial property and put something commercial there for those folks that are right there, and to bring some of the other people on the way home. You know, they stop there instead of continuing on into North Reading. Um, but it's still in North Reading. It brings it here instead of them stopping across the way a little bit. So. I, th I think it's a good idea to, to go out as a commercial uh, project this time. Yeah, we'll see what we get, and if we don't like it, we can, you know, we're not, you know, we're in no rush. That's right. Right? We have no, no real well, timeline here. Which, and we're I trying to take advantage of the market as it is today, but you know, if we don't like what we get, then we can reconsider again. Right. I think the last time when we went out for it, we just stopped because we had we had a timeline that we really wanted to hit with Pulte. Well, we weren't we wanted sure to get where things going to end up. Right. We weren't 100% sure. And cool. we wanted to get it done under a very tight time frame so that we could maximize the profit to the town. This one, we probably, even if we put it out and we had something that came in, we never would have made that timeline. So pushing it out and taking our time is, is, is the right thing to do this time, for sure. Unless there's majority of a strong objection I'd like to give the approval to go forward with it as um, as amended but what's what's as amended we're gonna mention Edward Edgewood departments oh yeah okay and uh, yeah. I think Fran you had a date amendment too right date amendment on, uh, yeah so we, it's on page seven mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Amending, uh, we amended a date from March 27th 2018 to April 10th Did you make that motion? No, um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I move to approve the draft RP for 102 Low Road. We had two amendments. We're going to mention Edgewood Apartments being a nearby locus, and also the date amendment on page 7 is going to move from March 27th to April 10th of this year. <coughs> I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. second. I get a second by Mrs. Okay. Mignopelli. Thank you, Mr. Mazzari. Any more discussion Mr. on it? Mr. Chairman, yes. I believe Mr. DeCoste has. Oh, sorry. So, so the one other amendment that we, I couldn't put in here because I didn't have it yet, was the, uh, the license to Pulte yes. that we would have to describe in the. Uh, That's right. Yeah, so into a corporate in, in uh, section 2.03, we would probably add it on the t to the uh, top of the paragraph, the paragraph at the top of the page on paragraph on page six. Mr. Chair, if I may amend the motion to also include as an amendment the license to Pulte, which would be on top of page six. Second. 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 Okay. <coughs> Mr. Gilberto, do you have anything else? Nope. Okay. We have the, the motion. Answers. We have a second. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just, uh, I will be voting in opposition, but I'm in full support. So how's that? <laughs> you know, in other words, it's, uh, you that know, I, I, I really think that we should, uh, <laughs> can't lose. Again, no, no, I, I, I can lose. I can be in the short end of the vote and still win. This is a good deal. Yeah. yeah. No, but I, I really think that we should uh, see what the market bears. But I've made my point, and, uh, but I'm in full support of uh, the effort, and uh, I hope to bear lots of fruit and more revenue for the town. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? No. Four to one passes. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. And thank you again, Fran, for always uh, making the time to join us. Next. MWRA Andover Water and Wastewater Review Status. Steve, you can't go down back up. Okay. Mr. Chairman, through you, um, Selectman Masseri O'Leary, Water Superintendent Mark Clark and I met this morning. We have a brief presentation that we'd like to go through. I'll ask the Water Superintendent to go through it if you don't mind. I don't mind. Just kind of gives us a little bit of historical context and then we can speak a little bit about what happened over the past couple of weeks in, uh, in Andover. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, can the folks at home see these slides? Do we need to move the TVs? 
a little better position. Okay. Very good. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Mark Clark, the Water Superintendent. Uh, again, a very, very brief presentation tonight. Just wanted to give a little historical perspective and uh, maybe answer some uh, <clears throat> misstatements that have been out there over the last couple of weeks. Um, so just really quickly, if we go back to 1991, it's kind of a watershed moment for us. Uh, if you think of North Reading in 1991, uh, we were at the point where the Stickney Well had gone out of service. Um, the state had come to the realization that the Ipswich River watershed was the most stressed river basin in Massachusetts. Subsequently, they were not allowing any additional water supplies to be developed within the watershed. Uh, North Reading was on the kind of the, the verge of a, a, a building boom. If you saw North Reading in the late 70s compared to where it was now, there were great areas of, of just forest and farmland that have now become subdivisions. North Reading recognized they didn't have sufficient water and couldn't possibly address their water supply needs from within the town. Subsequently, we petitioned the state for what's known as an interbasin transfer permit from the town of Andover. And in 1991, that was granted uh, a million and a half gallon a day interbasin transfer permit for us to take water from the Merrimack River Basin and bring it into the Ipswich River Basin. All of North Reading lies within the Ipswich River Basin. We're in the headwaters of the Ipswich River Basin. There's not a lot of upland above us uh, to contribute drainage. So the flows in the Ipswich River and in Martins Brook, which are the two primary uh, tributaries going through North Reading, they actually go down to zero. We see the river and the brook grow dry in certain summers. Uh, subsequently, we've got that interbasin transfer permit. That's a, basically a permanent permit. It does not expire. We do not have to reapply for that permit. So when it's shown on the, on the top bar of that graph, it basically goes off the right end of that graph, and, and it, it's basically there in perpetuity. Um, su subsequent or uh, simultaneous with that, we negotiated our first intermunicipal agreement with Andover, which was a 20-year agreement, ran from 1991 to 2011, and that's shown by that second red bar on the graph. Knowing that was about to expire, in 2009, we began negotiations with Andover to try to extend that agreement. Those negotiations actually ran through June of 2015 when we signed a five-year extension, even though it was an interim period where it was kind of out of, actually out of service. We had a five-year extension that expires on June 30th, 2019. This past summer, in the negotiations we've had with Andover, we've negotiated a one-year extension with a one -year, an additional one-year option, which would technically put us out to as late as June 30th of 2021 with an agreement with Andover. Just, just a quick question, and I don't need a huge history on this, but I've had several people in town continue to ask me about that water source that's in North Reading that Danvers uses and why we can't use that and why, you know, why isn't that part of this sort of history? If you could just touch upon it real quick. Sure, so we're mentioning Swan Pond. Swan Pond uh, the D Danvers Middleton water supply actually draw on Swan Pond periodically. Uh, the town actually had a consultant look at Swan Pond a long time ago as a potential water supply for North Reading. Swan Pond has a very small catchment area. There are no streams, there's no rivers, there's no even good sized brooks running into Swan Pond. It's kind of like a bowl and the water that falls from the edges of the bowl drain into Swan Pond. It's a very small usable volume. So. Back in the 1970s, our consultant calculated you could draw about 50,000 gallons a day reliably from Swan Pond. Now that sounds like a big, big volume. 50,000 gallons a day is less than 3% of North Reading's water supply needs. Swan Pond's a surface water, so the town would have to build a surface water treatment plant, which is an expensive proposition, would have to staff a surface water treatment plant in order to get maybe 3% of our water supply addressed from that. Swamp Pond, it is not, and I get this question fairly frequently, it is not a viable water supply for a community the size of North Reading. Just to kind of jump on that, if we think back to the 1970s, anybody that remembers, the town purchased a lot of area around Swan Pond. The thought was to build a reservoir there, and we actually had water rights in the 1970s to pump water direct from the Ipswich River into what was going to be called the uh, Mill Meadow or the Strawberry Meadow Reservoir, and that was going to be a water supply, but that never got further developed. If you look around Swan Pond on some of the, uh, 
the town maps. The, the town owns a lot of land up there. That was primarily acquired for that reservoir that never got developed. Just one more piece. Subsequently, in the 1980s, the state implemented what they call the Water Management Act, where you only had rights to what water you actually drew from 1981 to 1986. Because the town never developed that, the town never pumped any water from the Ipswich River, the town has zero rights to take. So even though there's legislature on the books from the 1970s to take 5 million gallons a day from the Ipswich River, we have zero water rights to the, to the river at this point. Thank you for explaining that. Kind of a long explanation, sorry. No, that's good. So, water rates. <clears throat> Don't put this on television. <laughs> <laughs> Is that swamp water? <laughs> water, water, water. Um, so there were some questions about water rates that, that have come up over the, the last couple of months. Here's a table showing water rates, whether you want to see them in cost per thousands of gallons or cost per hundred cubic feet. And over bills in hundreds of cubic feet, we bill in thousands of gallons. <clears throat> what you can see from the top down is the MWRA wholesale rate. That's what they charge to other communities. <clears throat> There's actually three Andover rates, Andover Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. Andover, three years ago, adopted a tier rate structure such as North Reading has, it's an increasing block rate structure, so as you use more water, it gets charged at a higher tier. <coughs> Excuse me. The current Andover uh, rate that they charge North Reading is kind of right in the middle. It's halfway between their two tier, Tier 2 and tier, tier 3 rate, so we're kind of their Tier 2.5 rate. And then you see North Reading's actual rates. Our rates are higher at all three tiers than uh, the Andover rates. Uh, and then you see just under the MWR rate is the 95% of the Andover Tier 1 rate. That's the rate that we were actually in conversations with Andover that they would be charging us if we were to be you know, into an agreement this current fiscal year. So it was tied to their Tier 1 water rate. If their Tier 1 water rate went up because they raised their rates, subsequently the 95% would also go up. Uh, there were some statements made at the Andover uh, town meeting about the cost of water in Andover and the cost of water in North Reading. North Reading residents pay significantly higher than Andover pays at all three tiers. Um, so I just wanted to show that this, this is, you know, a calculation of the same volume of water, what an Andover resident would be charged and what a North Reading resident would be charged. We pay uh, a little over double what they pay for their water. And this is the last slide I have. Why is North Reading so adamant about an, a long-term agreement? And I certainly don't want to step on any of the board members' toes, but what we're seeking is a permanent answer to our water supply question. Uh, it's either a long-term partnership with the town of Andover or actual membership in the MWRA. Um, why is this so important to us? We're looking to avoid these short-term agreements. If you think about that bar graph, you know, those, those agreements got shorter and shorter as we got through them. It actually took us longer to negotiate the extension to the first IMA than it actually will be in, in force. Um, the negotiations, they do become very dependent on kind of the political climate at the time, can result in unfavorable terms to one side or the other. Uh, you know, from my perspective, the current agreement we're in is not very favorable to North Reading. Statements were made, we don't have a crystal ball to see 99 years into the future, but we certainly have 27 years of history between North Reading and Andover, and we can look back, and we can understand how the situation has worked between the two towns, and we feel we can, based on that, understand what's going to happen in the future. There are certain you know, macro decisions that can be made based on what we do know. Um, again, the Interbasin Transfer Permit Act does not expire. Uh, MWRA membership does not expire. It may need to be renewed on a 10-year basis, but it's not an expiration in any way. Um, again, this issue was discussed at some lengths in the negotiations we've had going back to last summer. Uh, this was something in North Reading has always been adamant as being a need for uh, any agreement between the towns. And again, this is what was approved at North Reading's uh, town meeting in October. So that's kind of where we are tonight as kind of a basis for your discussion. Do we want to take a moment and maybe just give the public uh, an overview of what trans transpired at the Andover special town meeting related to the one article uh, tied to North Reading? Mr. O'Leary? Yeah. Um, was it last Monday evening, was it? 
Monday or Tuesday? A couple of Mondays ago. A couple of Mondays ago. <laughs> Seems just like last night or yesterday. Um, again, the town of Andover and the Board of Selectmen, uh, if the public recalls and the board members recall, you know, we signed a uh, uh, summary of terms of an intermunicipal agreement with the town of Andover um, in the short term, basically for an extension uh, for us to consider their proposal for basically two one-year extensions. But also, in addition to that, a summary of terms uh, which we negotiated with them over the terms of several months uh, to provide potable water for the, for the town of North Reading, uh, you know, including you know, how many gallons they're going to provide to us, what the cost is going to be, what it's going to be tied to, um, capital expenses, who's going to incur what, where. Uh, in addition to that, um, we were looking for, uh, we've spent uh, approximately a million dollars other than the purchase of uh, the land on Mill Street you know, $953,000 that we thought was um, necessary for them to reimburse us uh, for our costs incurred while we were looking and exploring the MWRA as a result of their decision back in 2014. Again, those was a term that they agreed to uh, pay us back 900, up to $953,000 on an annual basis for 10 years, $93,300 starting July 1st, 2018. Again, the tiered rate, again, would be basically a wholesale rate of their tier one, which is their lowest rate. Uh, and their annual increases would not exceed 2.5%. Uh, so we would have some sort of certainty as to uh, budgeting-wise what it would cost us. And uh, again, 99-year uh, term. Back in uh, the summer, uh, as recently as you know, our meeting at August 21st, uh, as part of these terms and conditions, uh, a uh, summary of terms uh, included in that was a uh, clause which would provide both parties to uh, exit the agreement with a five-year notice and some hefty uh, financial penalties associated with that. Uh, the majority of the members of this board at that particular time expressed some very strong concerns in relation to um, having any exit strategy. Obviously, the town of North Reading uh, is looking to avoid those sorts of uh, terms and conditions. And uh, Mr. Masseri and I and town administrator and Mark and the rest of the team uh, went back and uh, explained this to the uh, negotiating team for Andover. They understood. As we had said to them, you know, it's not the money. Um, if they were to, you know, decide and give us five years' notice, they would still have their water system. They would have to raise their rates to make up for the lost revenue. Uh, residents of North Reading wouldn't have water. You know, we wouldn't have water when we turned on the faucet, and we wouldn't have water to take showers or, or flush the toilets. So we're more concerned with the water, not the money and the rates at that particular time. And therefore, we were not looking for entering into any agreement with, a, uh, with an exit clause. Uh, that being said, you know, we understand, and what was expressed at the uh, town meeting um, by a resident that uh, 99 years is a long time and there should be some sort of a mechanism whereby both parties would be able to uh, offer up an option to get out of the deal with a five-year term. So an amendment was offered on the town meeting floor, which subsequently passed, uh, providing just that option to be included in the special legislation which they would uh, would be authorized to file. So I guess it's like a good news, bad news, uh, scratch your head type situation. You know, the good news is the town of Andover, and I don't think there was anybody, I think it was 750 or about 300, you know, opposed to the, to the motion. But even some of those that were opposed were still in favor of a long-term agreement with North Reading. So the vast majority of people up there certainly don't want to see their rates increase 28 to 30 percent, and they would uh, support entering into a 99-year agreement with the town of North Reading, and that's what they, they voted for. However, the amendment provides that the uh, Board of Selectmen in Andover would be required to negotiate into any terms and conditions negotiated with the town of North Reading uh, an option uh, to get out to be considered at year 20. Uh, much to our consternation, and I think I speak for Mr. Masseri and the administrator and anybody who was involved in the negotiations. We were extremely uh, surprised and disappointed 
uh, in the lack of, I don't know how I can say this uh, nicely, but lack of uh, effort put into uh, explaining to the uh, general public there in Andover at the town meeting uh, how this particular condition had already been discussed at length. Uh, the negotiating team understood our position and uh, felt as though it wouldn't be necessary to be included within any terms and conditions. Um, that wasn't done. I don't think to anybody's satisfaction, at least on this side. Uh, I think that the general public up there was not fully informed as to the rationale for North Reading's position on this. And uh, as a result, town meeting approved it with the amendment. Uh, you know, what does that mean? It means we passed an article at town meeting and they just mirrored our, our article you know, which just calls for, you know, a 99-year agreement being authorized by the legislature uh, and leaving the terms and conditions of the total agreement up to the Board of Selectmen to do what's in the best interest of the community. We asked Andover to do the same thing. This one little caveat certainly throws uh, a monkey wrench into the plan, uh, whereby uh, now the Andover Board of Selectmen is having a workshop Wednesday night to discuss uh, you know, how do they move forward with us? They've also voted at their last selectmen's meeting, you know, to ask for a joint meeting of the boards of selectmen, our board and their board jointly, uh, to discuss, you know, how can we move forward or can we move forward in relation to the action that was taken up there. You know, their hope is that it can and something can be worked out with us. You know, so we have um, a decision to make at some point. Uh, you know, is this a deal breaker? Or is there some opportunity that we want to avail ourselves of to negotiate some term and condition to mitigate the impact of, of what was voted at the town meeting? So, I mean, that's pretty much what's before the board right now. Um, obviously, we've spent uh, literally hundreds of hours negotiating in good faith. Um, there's been some, there appears to be some breakdown in communication, miscommunication, or uh, people weren't listening clearly up there so that there's a misunderstanding amongst even the board members up there as to whether this term of the five year out was included or not included, even though we have the signatures of you know, the majority of the board of selectmen up there, which did not include those terms. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, I, my colleagues, you know what we have to decide tonight is do we want to avail ourselves of the opportunity to meet with the, the board of selectmen up there, see what they have to offer in any uh, uh, suggestions they may have in order to um, continue on negotiations with them in relation to supplying us um, water for the long term. There's, there's no doubt that the deal that we had struck before is certainly worthy of consideration uh, economically and uh, for other ancillary uh, reasons uh, to strongly consider. One thing that Mr. Masseri and I stressed very strongly throughout the negotiations, several times over, was that, you know, we will, t after the board took the action, you know, we're taking the time to cons make this consideration of their proposal, but we're all set. You know, we already have the money appropriated to go with the MWRA and the construction projects uh, down in, down in Reading. Um, and they were reminded again that we're all set. Uh, and while it may appear on paper that it's more costly, and there's still some several hurdles to get over in order to bring that about. Um, we already have the authorization from our town meeting and appropriations to to bring it to fruition. Um, you know, I personally believe that uh, I think the extension of a courtesy of, of meeting with them to hear what they have to say and uh, how they uh, may offer something to um, mitigate the impact of what transpired at their town meeting is probably worthy of consideration. We should. Talk about that, I guess, tonight. I guess that's our first decision. Any other questions? Or? I have lots, but uh, yeah. we'll let Mr. Masseri jump in there. Just to add what Steve said is uh, back in September, when we came to an agreement and they voted four to one in support of it, and I just want to make that point. Right. They actually voted on a document, and uh, I think uh, they weren't whether they assumed it wasn't going to be an issue at their town meeting or what, they didn't seem very prepared to uh, t 
talk to the community about the importance of the agreement as it was when someone from the audience made that a motion to uh, require a review and the ability to terminate the agreement after 20 years. So uh, what Steve said was there were, there were meeting, now I think that's been confirmed they're having a work session on Wednesday night I think we should at least give them an opportunity to come back to us with something that makes sense. Uh, whatever action that might be, it's on their it's on their watch, and it's their obligation to uh, respond to and try to correct the issue. Or we will make the decision that we have to make. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Schultz and Mr. Minipelli. <laughs> Um, I think that a couple of things that were said at that uh, Andover Town meeting, which we were all, we all attended, um, included the representation that we had sort of uh, imposed this sort of strict deadline upon Andover, almost forced these terms upon Andover. And I think that really wasn't an accurate recitation of what has transpired. And I also want to thank M Mr. Gilberto, and Selectman O'Leary and Selectman Mossieri, who, who, like you just said, have put hundreds of hours into this and, you know, gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But we, we are already a water customer, and it did not appear from attending that meeting that there was a recognition that we, we have been a long-term water customer and a good water customer. We're a good-paying water customer to, to Andover. And and I also think that uh, another troubling thing that happened was, um, you know, sort of the suggestion that we, we we're suddenly forcing this upon Andover. And I think that's unfortunate. When I joined the board, or when I was elected to serve in 2015, the extension of that gr agreement had already been through four years of difficult negotiations until it was ultimately signed sometime in June or j around June of that year. And to, to um, sort of impose this additional term upon it, we'd, we're not reaching our long-term long goal. In the course of those discussions back then when we were entering that agreement, there was a mention of us missing the boat joining the MR, MWRA years and years ago, right? We just heard about missing the boat on something we could have done on, you know, with Swan Pond. I, I'm using missing the boat, and I, that's, yeah. probably, I, that's probably why you just smiled, I just realized, no pun intended, yeah. but. Our extensions of courtesy, they're normal, we're neighbors. We, we have these mutual agreements with our neighbors. This seemed, seemed to me and always has seemed to me to be a pretty pretty open and shut thing. We are a water customer. We need the water. We're a good neighbor. They're a good neighbor to us. But I think these repetitive extensions of courtesy, which, you know, they're, they're, they seem to be taking us off track here, um, they're discourteous to Reading, I think, at this point. I think we need to move forward now. We already, like you said, Mr. O'Leary, we already have the authority. The town has already told us, move forward. Um, and I think that there's not, I don't know what possibly could, with the amendment as it was voted, I don't know what possibly could entice us down that path. We need to work with Andover on writing what we're do moving forward with on writing anyway. So it's, it's not as though if we, Move, move forward, we're not going to still be neighbors and still be working with Andover on a host of issues here. I just don't, I think it's time to move forward and that's, that's my opinion. And I've always had that stance, but I've always, you know, <coughs> listened to my colleagues, you know, give it another chance or give it another opportunity. But I think at this point, we're, we're, we're just delaying the inevitable and that's my opinion. That's my opinion. I believe we should just be moving forward, getting things moving forward now with Reading and the MWRA. Can I just make a point just to address a couple of issues? Right. Uh, first of all, you know, um, 
we didn't have an opportunity back in 1991 to go with the MWRA. They were not taking on any more customers at that particular time. So we did not have an opportunity there. You know, as far as Swan Pond and building Mill Meadow back in the 70s, that was going to be a joint venture with the town of Linfield, which never, we, again, took the land in order to, to build it, but then couldn't come to terms with the town of Linfield in order to uh, determine who was going to have the most say of, or who was going to control the reservoir. Uh, so it never came to fruition. But we didn't have an opportunity to join the MWRA way back when. But I think you're absolutely correct as far as a mischaracterization uh, of, of what really transpired and you know, what uh, truly translated into the rates that we're paying today. You know, back in 2014, we approached Andover and asked them, you know, we're looking for a long-term solution. Are you willing to offer and partner with us to do that? And the answer was no. So we had to negotiate uh, uh, an extension of the intermunicipal agreement, you know, to give us time to look for an alternative. And that was the result that you saw. And in that uh, agreement, it resulted in us paying higher rates than we were previously, knowing that it was an exit strategy and we were going to be getting out because we were looking for a long-term solution to not only meet our current needs but also our potential future needs based upon the projections we had as to how the town would look when we built out down the road. Um, and, and again, when we got the approval from town meeting for all the MWRA uh, contracts and um, construction down in Reading and the tie-in and the uh, the buy-in costs, we did not have the Andover deal in front of us. We had just started negotiations with them, and it was a direct result of their uh, response to a DEIR process, which said, oh, we can do that now. And we had been asking for months, what do you mean by that? And finally, we had started the discussions. But in the meantime, we were moving forward. So when we presented those articles to the uh, June town meeting, we didn't have uh, any indication, clear indication as to what and it was really truly offering and whether it was a, something that we should consider. So in fairness, um, again, they were late to the game, certainly, uh, which was evidenced by the fact that in, was it October, September, October, we voted to postpone construction, uh, letting construction contracts out for a reading, you know, for an entire, up to a, up to a year, uh, in order to consider their proposal. So when we asked town meeting for the approvals and. June for the appropriations, we didn't have this opportunity on the table. It was over the summer months where it all developed, and then in October, uh, we again asked town meeting for permission to file the special legislation for tying in into municipal agreements with Reading, MWRA, Andover, and uh, we set a deadline on ourselves for sometime in April making a determination as to which way we were going to go. So uh, obviously, Andover got our attention with their proposal because economically it uh, Makes a heck of a lot of sense, um, and we came to the agreement that we did. So, so again, the rates we're paying now are well based upon an exit strategy uh, being done by June 30th, 2019, and having ever turned the spigot on with MWRA and turning it off with Andover. Uh, but that changed. So now the only thing that uh, that has changed, truly, is uh, what happened at the town meeting in uh, on one term and condition which we had already. Uh, explained to them we didn't find acceptable and uh, and it was included so you know to me I still think uh, this is certainly a proposal that is still worthy of consideration it's just a question as to whether or not we believe that that one hurdle is insurmountable and is a deal breaker and, and I think if they have some sort of uh, a proposal for us to consider uh, we should hear it before we make a final decision. <coughs> Mr. Um, I'm coming at this a little bit from a different angle. It's the old saying, those who refuse to look at history are doomed to repeat it. The first IMA we had was for 20 years. It ended in 2011. We started negotiations to get a long-term solution back in 2009. It's now 2018, and we're not any closer than we were really in 2009, in my opinion. We just keep kicking this can down the road. We all went to the town meeting, um, and that was the voters by a probably a two to one margin voted against having a 99 year agreement. The current agreement is really a 25 year agreement because after 20 years, there's a five year out at any point. The problem I have is every year, construction wise, we wait to hook up with the NWRA. Your construction costs are going to be more every single year. 
what's the cost going to be 20 years from now when we have the same problem with Andover? When I'm looking at history, we've had the same problem for the last 20 years. When I watched their selectmen meeting, I think it was last week, it was very dysfunctional. I mean, there was selectmen accusing the town manager of not being up front with some of the terms. There were board members accusing other board members of not, you know, relaying them correct, cor relaying to them correctly what Selectman Mosiri and Selectman O'Leary said to them. It, you know, I, I don't want to criticize, but it was the gang who couldn't shoot straight. And their voters at the town meeting have voted. Even if the Andover Board of Selectmen want to do a different deal, they can't. Their voters have locked them in. We're just wasting time and we're wasting construction seasons. We owe it to our colleagues at the NWRA and the town of Reading especially, who I know for a fact feel like we've left them at the altar. We can't afford to lose those good relationships trying to go chasing this mirage that we've chased for 10 years now. The other thing that gets lost, I know NWRA has higher startup costs, but I took a chance to look at the FXM associate study we did on back in May of 2011 on the increase of tax revenue if you get, say, sewerage on Concord Street, which you can with the NWRA. This was 2011 numbers. You're looking at $300,000 to $600,000 a year of additional tax revenue to the town. That's from 2011. I'm, I'm sorry, 2011 it was 250 to 500. I would submit nowadays it's probably 300 to $600,000 a year. Additional tax revenue you're gonna have. You're gonna make up those buying costs over time. You're gonna have a permanent solution we're not going to kick the can down to our kids and our grandkids. That's all we are doing with this. And for the life of me, I don't understand why we'd want to sit down and meet with Andover again because their voters at town meeting did not give their board of selectmen authority to enter an agreement what we said was a deal breaker, meaning the permanency. They can't do what we want to do. So why are we meeting? We're just, in my opinion, we're just wasting time and it's time to move on. Well, I have to say it's been a long challenging road on this subject um, in town and over town meeting was very unnerving because you would have thought if I wasn't involved in this board board and it was maybe my first month on this board I would have thought like we never really met with these guys and never really expressed what we were expecting and what the you know was the agreement in jello or was the um, I should say the agreement in principle was it in jello or was it in concrete because what was presented was it was bizarre at least and to only hear one member this is where my real disappointment comes in only one member that was in favor of what we we're trying to accomplish here out of the four that voted got up and spoke and one member that was against who's been very clear from day one that he's been against this and all the power to him he did a wonderful job actually he was the most articulate and clear in his message out of the other four that were in favor of this which was bizarre is that the other three members that voted in favor of this never got up. And I would love to exp under just understand why, you know, for some, this board here, we may not all be in agreement on a lot of things, but I think we all make the effort to get up and clearly articulate our position, all five of us. And I think you have to do that. And they didn't do that there, which makes me believe, are they really for this or are they really not? And maybe we could start there, and then I can finish my little spiel, and then we can <laughs> move on. <laughs> if you want. Are you okay? I can continue? Yeah. Okay. And the other thing that made me very unnerving is at the point where this suggested amendment was being made, the town manager expressed to the people in the crowd that if they go forward with this amendment, it doesn't fit with what North Reading is trying to accomplish, and they most likely wouldn't be in agreement. And people stood up and cheered. The residents actually got up out of their chairs and clapped and screamed and clapped. And that's unnerving too because the message isn't getting across to them that we are a good customer. We are a good partner with them. We want to be a good partner with them. I think we bring a lot to the bottom line for Andover. And we help their system to continue to be a healthy, clean operating system. And I believe we would do that if we could continue on the relationship that we have today. Um, so clearly this particular board in Andover did not do a great job educating the community on how important we are to this process. Do I think it will get any better after today if we extend, if we want to wait any longer? No, I don't. I've lost complete confidence because you know where I stood on this. I was bought in 
you know, MWR came to our rescue as far as I'm concerned, and Reading as well. But the offer that you guys worked so hard on, I give you a lot of credit, brought a lot of merit and had to, if it would be wrong of me, it would have been a fiduciary irresponsibility, responsible of me to have not considered it and listened through when you brought forward at least the draft um, proposal. And I think it was a win-win for both, I do. Even though members in the community in Andover believe that this was so favorable to North Reading, I think I'm looking at it all wrong. And I don't think they could ever look at it any other way, no matter what you do. Uh, I know we could sit here and say, we've got to allow Andover one more opportunity to see how they can make this right. But the town meeting spoke, and do you believe that they're going to go back and have another special town meeting in the next two weeks or next month? I, I can't imagine they would because the reason this is still up there is because that's our goal. And we went to, our, to the public and we told them we are adamant on a 99-year agreement and we would be taking a lot of risk. And as Mr. Schultz expressed, what's in place now is, yeah, maybe a 99 agreement, but after 20 years, the they can just at any time say, here's a letter, you have five years to get out of our system. So think about that. For 20 years, we're going to make significant capital investments in their system. We're going to pay their rates. We're going to keep paying our money. We're going to continue to keep investing in their system. And then after 20 years, we get five years to get out of the system. And where did our capital investment go after that? 25-year investment. And we have to go and find a new place to go get water. Guys, that's not a comforting situation. So I know you want us to wait. And I don't disagree, not a respect to the both of you for the time and effort you put in. I'm going to ask the board not to make a decision tonight. But I am going to say that on the 26th of this month, I am going to be prepared and ready to make a decision. And whatever happens between now and then is up to Andover. But I think we owe it to Reading, we owe it to MWRA to make a clear position where we stand on February 26th. And, and I hope the public, if the public is concerned or they're they're not clear on what's going on, I welcome them to attend on the 26th because I think communication is very important on this. This is not political. I'm not in bed with MWRA. I'm not in, this has nothing to do with me personally. It's right there. And well, that's what we're gonna, and I'm focused on that. I'm a mission-oriented individual, and my mission is clear. And if we can't come up with a way to achieve that mission between now and the 26th, I'm gonna ask the two of you to vote with us, and I'm gonna ask that and over board if they're home listening this evening or they watch this on YouTube. We did our best. We really did. We worked hard and it didn't work out. So all I ask is that you work with us. If the future for us, the MWRA, let's stay working together as two communities and we can't let what's happened and transpired up to now take us away from that. We've achieved so much and the good thing is we have to have emergency connection for them and they need one from us. And we, we want to have, the, we want to work with the Greater Lawrence Sword District for the future of the town at some point. And we'd love, and I would love them to continue to have a willingness to do that, regardless of what transpires here. We did what we were asked to do, and we were respectful in the process. And so if this doesn't work out, I don't want it to be held against us negatively because you guys worked very hard, and you were honest and clear and precise. Everything was in concrete, nothing was in jello. So if the board would, you know, agree with me, I would appreciate we give the opportunity, but anyone else? I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Mrs. Menupelli and then Mr. Masseri. Oh, Do you wanna call Mr. Masseri? We haven't had a chance uh, to talk. I, I appreciate very much, Michael, you holding off to our next meeting, because I think that overall, there are a number of citizens in North Reading that yep. have Lord a fear of MWR. Yep. And this will, I think, getting this last input from the, the Andover board, and we make a decision at our next meeting, or con, depending on what comes forward, we're in a, a better situation in terms of expressing to our public why we're making this decision at this point. I'm not asking to continue on the path that, there were, uh, that we've been on down to April when we agreed we'd make a decision. But I think waiting to our next meeting, I think is, I'm asking that as a, as a favor to the board members for the effort that Steve and I and Michael have, have put in. I wanna hear 
and everything you've said is right. I mean, we're all at the we're all at the town meeting, and maybe not all of us, but some of us watched the board meeting the following Monday, and uh, you know, I left my head. I, I left scratching my head real hard because I was totally surprised and totally shocked by the lack of them getting up and supporting uh, what they voted quarter one for in September, which has got us to the point where we are today. So, thank you. Ms. I, 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 I'm not that surprised because town meeting, town people rule, that's what it is. Voters rule and, and the voters got up and expressed what they wanted quite clearly, I think, from, from sitting in on that meeting. So I, I'm not as harsh on the selectmen as uh, maybe my colleagues want to be. But I also think that, you know, okay, we didn't have the opportunity to join the MWRA before. We, did, we don't have the opportunity to draw from our own water sources within the town. We have that opportunity now and let's, let's, move, let's move forward. And I also think that, um, you know, <coughs> like uh, Selectman um, Schultz said, we're no closer to knowing the answers that we were looking for back then that w than we do now. Uh, you know, studies, can they supply us with a full water supply versus the capacity that they're currently supplying? Can they meet our long-term needs? We don't have the answers to those questions either. And just one more thing, you, s you mentioned two dates. April 26th and February 22nd. Sorry, I'm all <laughs> over the board. I'm exhausted. No, I had a I long day. Our next meeting is February 26th. But Andover has extended an olive branch to us to meet with them in a joint meeting, which I think we should take them up on it. Because I think what I have to say, I have no problem with saying in front of them. And it gives them an opportunity to really understand where we're at in this whole thing. Um, and it will give us a better idea um, because Bob and Steve have done everything they can to bring back to us the feedback in writing, right? To make it even as clear as we can. I think we owe it to them to make the commitment to sit in front of them to help them because I don't think it's getting articulated clearly on both ends. But the problem is we don't have a lot of time between now and then. We have a holiday in there as well. So the date is the 26th. That's our next Board of Selectmen meeting. But we, do sh if we should consider tonight giving them a proposed date or a joint meeting that we can post. Yes, Mr. Schultz. If Schultz's. I may speak to that, where my frustration comes in the most is Selectman O'Leary and Selectman O'Leary spent, I don't know how many hundreds of hours on this over the last how many years? And no, just in the last year. <laughs> exactly. <Truly. laughs> and when we went back to them last year, you guys specifically went, the 99 year thing is a deal breaker. You guys couldn't have been any more clear. And when I watched their Selectman meeting, I think it was last Monday, half the board didn't even know about that and then they were complaining that they weren't advised by the town manager and then it was, well didn't you read what you signed I mean it was I personally don't feel we should meet with them between now and them I think we should listen to them if they come up with a proposal but I don't see where their town voters gave them the authority to do anything more than something that is unacceptable to us so I just don't want to waste everyone's time I mean, they can't do a 99 year agreement a full a true 99 year agreement so why meet with them? That, to me, that's a deal breaker. That's just, I'm just one of five. I mean, we don't have to, but we can allow our subcommittee members here to continue to meet with them. Um, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, again, there may be some sort of, uh, you know, while there is a restriction on the Board of Selectmen and Andover to include a five-year out after 20 years, that doesn't preclude them from negotiating other terms and conditions within the agreement that would make that economically unfeasible to do so and uh, alleviate maybe some of our concern in relation to whether or not they would even ever consider doing it. So I, I think we need to provide them with that opportunity. Additionally, when it comes to the special legislation, um, the, again, we have an opinion from our council, but also their council that advised their chairman, you know, whatever happens in the legislature, if the legislature determines when the two bills get filed, you know, that, that one uh, term of uh, including a five year is more instructional from their town meeting to their board, and restricts their board as to what they can agree to, and not to be included in the special leg legislation that can be, that can assist also in the process. Um, but I think it's um, I think it's important to uh, to meet with them face to face. And again, and 
let them hear out and they can watch it now, but they can get it face to face too as far as our level of frustration as to what occurred and uh, what's occurring now and again the position we've been put in uh, to make a decision because they weren't able to follow through and, and you know to your point Mr. Chairman you know I, I think you know, Mr. Masseri and I and the town administrator, town administrator have been uh, very careful to ensure that every member of this board was fully informed as to how the negotiations were going, where we were at, terms and conditions, uh, no room for misunderstanding and uh, communicating to the public as well as to where we were at, particularly even at our October town meeting when we had this uh, intermunicipal agreement summary of terms all lined up and signed by their board. Which so they attended, by the way. Would, which they attended. Which they were in attendance. Which they were in attendance. You know, and, and to Andrew's uh, observation, mine too, was I was dumbfounded by the uh, disconnect, the, the response or the uh, expressions of concern expressed by members of the board, never mind the public, as to their lack of understanding as to what they had signed and sent down to us. I, I don't get it. You know, Bob doesn't get it. We were watching, we were going, how could this happen? So, but we had no control over that. You know, we did everything we could in the public venue uh, to get it out there. Um, but that's apparently they didn't do a very good job of, of, of articulating our concerns, uh, why they agreed to it, and uh, communicating even amongst themselves. And that, of course, led to, I believe, what occurred at town meeting. Because it's important to know that at town meeting, you know, what was brought up was the $953,000. So paying us back was a million dollars. Brought up, dismissed, gone, accepted. Um, you know, 95% of the tier one rate. I think I was quoted, quoted on the big board. It may have been taken out of context, but that's okay. Like you know, it. you know. Um, and I didn't take offense, by the way. I'll tell Mr. <laughs> Kowalski, you know, he took it out of context, but that's okay because, you know, our, uh, our little old lady, as he said, you know, uh, is paying twice as much as their little old lady even so. Um, even though we're buying their water at a reduced rate because we still have to support our system here. Uh, but uh, th that being said, uh, that was addressed and was not the subject of any type of uh, excess discussion or even an amendment. So, you know, the, the good part was, you know, they went for the 95, uh, uh, the 99 years, they went for the 95%, they went to pay back almost a million dollars to us and all the other terms and condi conditions we had uh, agreed to other than this one and I think the uh, uh, lack of support for what we agreed to was deafening. I mean, they didn't say it. I don't know. I, I didn't get it. And I, was, I almost got up at town meeting at their town meeting. I'm not even a member. I, I was so frustrated at the time. And then it wasn't until after the vote was taken that the town manager said, this might be a deal breaker. After the vote was taken. Not before. It wasn't a close vote. It was after yeah, the right No, it wasn't a close vote. But the thing is, that the argument... There was, was more of an argument late. made after the vote was taken than before. But, but again, we can't change that. You know, all we can do now is, uh, you know, can this be salvaged? You know, can they come up with some sort of a proposal that will mitigate the impact of what was done? And I think they deserve an opportunity to do that, and I think we have an obligation to listen to it. Uh, you know, we don't need to kick it down the road for a long period of time because they have to come up with something that, again, as I told the chairman, it has to get our attention just as your other proposal had to several months ago. And well, that's uh, why I think... I don't want to sound unreasonable when I say the 26th of February, but as you went down that little checklist, Steve, everything is checked off. We, we just have this one thing, and I don't want it delayed anymore. Everything that was in the agreement was checked off. It's what wasn't in the agreement that wasn't it's checked very, off. Very concerning, <laughs> that one thing, and I just want to say this. You see the way they're acting now. We're going to be, bringing, we're going to be sending them $3 million a year, roughly, somewhere around there, to an organization that treats us this way it's that's concerning to me and I think you have to put that into your your thinking as we make a decision going forward and then the last thing I want to say on this is um, we should just decide do we want to meet with them or not let's decide now uh, I, I kind of agree with mr. Schultz I, I have a lot of confidence in you um, I, I think you you know having another joint meeting between now and that's gonna be really hard we, we never had a joint meeting so I think if we need one if there's gonna be one it should be now and um, and I think it should just be the only thing on the agenda. And what do you think? Maybe next Thursday night? Well, they're meeting Wednesday, right? They're meeting this Wednesday. They're, this now this, this one is just so a they're workshop. They're not expecting us there. No, they're not expecting us there. They're not expecting public input there again, just to see if they can get themselves all on the same page. They uh, do know it's Valentine's Day that day, huh? 
So, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. So yes. the following Thursday, again, would give us uh, ample time to give them notice, post and uh, us also, and we should invite them here. Make them come here. I think we should invite them here. Not us go there. I think we should invite them here. We, it should be here, Michael. Mr. Schultz. I have no problem with listening to their proposal. I just get back to the fact that. I don't know that, if they have a proposal, by the way. Right, <laughs> number one. Number two. They can't give us what they want because their voters didn't allow it. So I don't see the need. I'm not going to vote to meet with them, but I will listen. I mean, we want to be reasonable. I just don't see where we, why are we meeting with somebody who, by their own voters, can't give them, can't give us what we need. It just seems like a waste of time. Mr. your belly. And I agree because I, I don't, I, I'm not surprised, again, the town people rule and the town people voted and did not agree. That's why the amendment was proposed. So to make some sort of fancy terms around what the town people said should be done is going to lead us down the same path again. I, I doubt that that's going to be acceptable to you know, work around what was voted. Mr. Masseri. I've been going to a lot of town meetings since living in North Reading. How many? <laughs> How many? But my point is this, and specifically since I've been on the board, when the board put an article in the warrant, there were times when the citizens of North Reading didn't want it. But the board got up and explained what it was all about and why it was there and fought hard to get the votes. That was missing. That was a disappointment. I'm giving them one more chance. At least I'd like to see them have one more chance. Tell us what they can do. Maybe they can't do anything, right? And we'll make a decision on the 26th or whenever the meeting So is. how about this? I uh, want to say one other thing, sorry. Michael, please. Go right ahead. Uh, board members thank Steve and I and the town administrator for all the hours put in, but we forgot a few people. Mark Clark, Mark Clark. was at every single meeting. Yep. Andrew Lafferty. And Andrew Lafferty, and then our consultants in a various well, we'll mix, it. okay? We sh can't forget them, too. That's well, remember, we started this, Mr. Masir, you and I, and I want to say the February of 2014 time, maybe January of 2014. We started this process and spent many months going through the initial start of this. Um, and how we ended up here, we don't need to rehash it, but this has been going on a long time. And, and I just think we're at a point now where, as it was stated already, even though we have a self-imposed posed date around April, I think with everything that's transpired and wherever we are at, we should be able to make this decision and we owe it to MWRA and to, to Reading to tell them, you know what, come a hell of high water, we're gonna give you a decision. We're not gonna string you along any longer. I think we should, if we're willing to make a commitment as a board to do that on the 26th, then I'm willing to do whatever you're requesting of us. And if that's, if you're suggesting that we accept hosting and having a, um, a joint meeting with them, then I will agree to it. But we all have to be in agreement that once we get through the process that we're gonna make a decision as a board. I don't care if it's unanimous or not, that we're gonna be ready to make a decision on the 26th because we've come a long way. I just don't think we need a meeting with them. They can come to us with a proposal without us meeting. I don't want meeting face to face. That's okay. I think you've made it clear. Yeah. And if you want to attend, you can. If you don't, yeah. uh, but the three of us, I think, are committed to doing it. And I'll leave it up to you to decide what you want to do. Um, I would hope. That, I would hope that if your schedule allows, you would attend. Yeah, of course. I would go by the. I just think. We're but no, listen. Time. I wouldn't think less of you yeah. than I already do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you didn't attend. No, oh, I would be there. I just think I don't understand this why. This is a tough subject. Yeah, and I know we're trying to repeat ourselves, but why are we meeting with people that can't, by their own voters, give us what is a deal breaker to us? Why are we wasting their time? Um, I think out of respect yeah. to the gentleman since you left, I, am, I think we owe it to him. But that's my opinion. Yeah. You can make any decision you want. Um, and you would suggest that Mr. O'Leary the 22nd, I believe? It's Thursday. That's vacation week? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't they come to our meeting? We'll be here all night. 
I don't see me with them being a half an hour endeavor. It's going to be an all in or two. What about this Thursday? Is that enough time, though, to post and even find out if well, they're available? Well, their members are away. I think their town manager's away, the town right? Town manager's yes. away, and I think Mr. Landry's away. And then Monday's a holiday, and then that whole week is vacation week, right? I forgot about that. I don't have vacation weeks anymore, so uh, actually, I'm going to be away. Um, I'm going to be gone the 20. I won't be home till the evening or the late. I'll be home in time on the 22nd. Uh, I'm coming back from Syracuse. Um, Mr. Chair, on the 22nd. can we block off an hour at our meeting on the 26th? That's going to be a long night, but it's one night instead of two. Thoughts? Still there? It's just a challenging week with vacation week. I think we've got to commit it to do it, but I think it presents us some personal challenges. I have no evening commitments, so any any time to fix the rest of the board members, they'll get with um, me. Unfortunately, I think the desire is to do it. It's just that I think our ability to do it is not there. <coughs> so. Yes. I'll just note that that evening, February 26th, according to the town of Andover's website, there is apparently a, what looks like a regular meeting of the Andover Board of Selectmen also scheduled. That's going to pose a challenge as well. And then when is our rec next regular schedule? Is the 5th or is that just budget? It's a regular meeting on the 5th. March 5th is a regular? It is. With budget hearings, yes. To be clear, with budget Regular hearings, with, with budget, budget hearings. hearings, right? Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, we have we have a busy night. That's Saturday the thirds are Monday. No, no, I know that. But yeah. well, I so like I said earlier, I still believe that they can. They're the ones that have the work to do, not us. And I think they just need to make a decision and make a proposal and present it to us. I still don't believe we have to meet. I know you you want us to meet with them, but I think based on what you see in the schedules. That's obviously not going to allow us to, and I'm firm on my position about the 26th. Um, I'd I would rather ask, I would ask you maybe to put it off until the 3rd, because if we can meet somewhere between the 26th and the, and the, uh, and the 5th uh, with them, this chief's the same thing, you're just pushing it out a week. And again, I don't think a week's going to make that much of a difference, you know, as far as. You're talking, what, what meet with them between now and just because I'm traveling the 27th and 28th. So I could we'll do it the meet evening of the 28th or the 1st. So that will be the 1st. Um, the 1st. I'm concerned with our friends in Reading if we, they're looking for some answers from us. The, the, our friends in Reading have been well aware, and again, Mr. Masseri and mm -hmm. the administrator, Mr. Clark, we've been communicating with them on a regular basis. They knew that we had imposed a, an April deadline on ourselves to make a decision. We met with the MWRA. Um, board and everybody else they're all well aware as to what we have they're looking schedule. for a direction from us now since who I mean based upon our conversations with us sitting down with them we have conversed with them kept them well informed and okay. we had told them April and they were fine with the timeline there's some hard feelings there I'm, I'm just telling you that we can pretend well, they don't exist but there, there is so I just mrs. Minupelli yeah. and mr. Schultz I, I don't think we need to argue that point uh, I think what we're trying to find is a happy medium here we're meeting on the 26th, and the request is to put this decision off one more week. One more one week and meet on the 1st first of March with Andover. First of the, yeah, the 1st of March with Andover. We have an EDC meeting that night. Yeah, well, that's going to have to. Yeah, it is an EDC meeting that evening, right? Yeah, we'll have to postpone it. I mean, clearly this takes precedent. Um, yeah. And we may be able to do both depending on the timing. The EDC is going to be meeting. It's going to be important, though, too, because we have um, Secretary Ash coming, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Oh, God. Is there any way to... Would you be objective to us making the decision on the 5th? No. No, of course not. It's, it's it only another week and, of And time. if we could do it the 28th? Is that Wednesday's a conf conflict? The 28th of February. That's after school vacation weeks are over. Um, just because I, the EDC meeting is going to be, I think, important uh, as we have to prepare 
for uh, the Secretariat's uh, visit. I, I hate to postpone that meeting. But if if it's critical, then it gets postponed, postponed. So I know you don't like it. Um, I just think we're going to be kicking the, on March 5th. It's going to be something else we can't on the road. Mr. Schultz, yeah. I think what's important is, and I haven't heard any objection by anybody on this board, that after we make this decision, we're clear on it. We're making a decision on that evening, whether it's the 26th or the 5th. And then if now That's it's fine. the 5th, then we're making the decision. <coughs> I think it's no, we just out of disagree. respect okay. we can make sure we have a message get along to uh, the town of Reading and also to the MWRA that listen in that evening on the 5th, we're making a decision. And the public will has a plenty of opportunity between now and then. And I do like the fact that it does give a, another extra week for the public to ask questions. Because there is a significant amount of residents that want us to stay with Andover. And I, and I respect that. But they have to understand this is a bigger decision than just I like their water. Uh, this is... Uh, it's frustrating. We have to make sure every one of them that cares is aware of this and that we don't do anything under the radar. No, this is probably the single most important decision we're going to be making uh, yeah. in a long time yep. since I've been sitting on the board. So, yep. um, you know, we, we haven't taken it lightly, we shouldn't take it lightly, and we shouldn't uh, necessarily, you know, no, uh, make a rash decision based upon uh, a poor decision on our friends up, up north and give them an opportunity to address the situation with us and if they can uh, come to some sort of a suggestion as to why we should continue to negotiate with them, we should hear it. Okay. Good. So if you could make that happen, we, we have to move your agenda to add this on as a decision. Uh, hopefully it won't take us a lot, of a lot of time on the 5th. I don't know how it affects your budget schedule. It'll be need to be pushed to after the, uh, the budget hearings, I think, which will be in the 9 o'clock hour most likely, but there's not much more we can do. Do what you get. Yeah. We could, have, we could start earlier that night. That's uh, an alternative. I mean, if the board members are available for a... We just don't have an executive session to allow Mrs. Minupelli to get here on. Yeah, uh, that's a possibility, Mr. Chairman. Consider it. We'll yeah. work on it. we got plenty okay. of time. Okay. We're good. We're going to move on. Okay. So we're meeting. We're going to ask... Um, Mr. 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 O'Leary and Mr. Oh. Masseri are going to take the action to work with Andover to set up a joint meeting okay. and it will be here and it will either be the 28th of February or the 1st of March, whatever oh, works okay. for everybody. Okay. If we can all... Is there any conflicts right now with anybody here on the 28th or the 1st? That's it. Just a little on the 1st for me, but it's, you know, you can it's make in this is a part. Yeah, so, yeah. But that's why I desi my desire would be the 28th, but if you, you find with them the majority is the 1st, then it's the 1st. Gives you two dates now to work with them. Okay. <coughs> God bless. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Next on the agenda is um, the draft FY 2019 revenue plan. It's going to be outstanding. So. No. Why Mr. Chairman. The, uh, no. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, yes. We provide thank you, Mark, for the presentation, by the way. And thank you for staying late. <coughs> We have provided a, uh, in the packet a copy of the version of the fiscal year 2019 revenue and expense plan that was reviewed with the financial planning team meeting at its last meeting on January 10th. My intention was to provide that document to the board so that the board was aware of uh, where things stand with regard to the projections going into fiscal year 2019. We have a financial planning team meeting scheduled for this Thursday uh, in the morning, I believe. And I expect that there'll be an updated fin uh, revenue plan that will be presented at that meeting and subsequently forwarded to the board. So our intention, my intention, would be to make a more detailed description of where things stand going uh, into fiscal year 19 at the meeting of February 26th. So I provided it more informational at this point in time. I'm happy to answer questions, but our intention is to further update it after the financial planning team meeting and to go through a PowerPoint presentation uh, at the February 26th meeting. Can I ask a favor? Nobody objects. Can we shut off the heat? Sure. I, do. I object. <laughs> a little toasty in here. <laughs> Continue. I can hear you now. Now, as far as what you've given us, right now it's out of balance by how much? Uh, we're still working on the town administrator's 
budget recommendations, which will be provided to the board uh, tomorrow. That's our intention. Uh, but I think the level services? I, I, it's hard for me to comment on it right now as we're still going through finalizing, but it certainly is out of balance, no different than it is or has been in the previous fiscal years. And Do you have a, uh, has the school come up with a preliminary budget yet? Um, I, so I believe we're going to receive that information from them okay, at the financial so planning meeting on Thursday. Could you uh, put the revenue plan as it stands, as, as presented here, in Dropbox, and then continue with when it's updated? Sure, oh, yeah. I have absolutely. Because when it's a PDF patched in here, it's... I mean, and just to respond to the comments, I mean, I, I, certainly it's no secret that we asked for requests not only for level services but for proposals beyond level services. So those requests, meaning those that are beyond level services, will drive to a, a more challenging reconciliation process. The finance director and I, as I've indicated to the board previously, have been meeting with um, departments to formulate a recommendation. Um, that recommendation will not be in balance as we go through the effort for the refining the revenue and expense plan, but we'll take the feedback from the board during the budget process and recommend reconciliation by the time the budget's finalized for the town meeting warrant, uh, which we expect will be the last week of April, first week of May. Is there anything else, Mr. Cabarro? Not on that matter at this point. Okay. The next um, is going to be the review of the Public Safety Director Implementation Plan. Implementation plan. Huh? I need some water. Mr. Chairman, through you, uh, this presentation is incorrectly labeled 122-2018. It's updated this evening and it was updated in your packet submitted on Thursday evening. What I've done basically is gone through and updated the last slide relative to potential implementation options, which is what the uh, charge that was uh, given and approved at the last board meeting. So I'll go quickly through these slides just to refresh folks. But the first, uh, all of the slides with the exception of the last one are the same as they were at the last board meeting. So again, just focusing on the discussion um, and, and why this discussion has come up now. Um, the growing needs uh, in public safety, transition in multiple departments, particularly looking at the sustainability of the fire department staffing approach. And as you know, I have some comments and, uh, that I'll be offering to the board later on during the meeting relative to um, overtime costs for this current fiscal year in the fire department. My belief that we need to begin looking and planning to go to a civilian dispatch center here in North Reading, um, as well as uh, the feedback from the board along the way. <coughs> uh, we've talked at all, I think at this point, relative to the charter uh, set up and the fact that there is the division of public safety that encompasses the police department, fire department, emergency preparedness, health department, and inspection services. <coughs> um, there's a notation there. Um, this is the current breakdown of divisions uh, per the charter. This is the uh, effective functional breakdown of responsibilities in effect today with only two of the divisions in effect, meaning public works and finance. Uh, table of organization for public safety here. The staffing level, which I reviewed at the last meeting. The potential table of organization create with the creation of the public safety director position. Uh, comments with regard to dispatch, which uh, again I won't rehash, but something that I believe uh, not only have we discussed in strategic planning, but also now is an opportunity for us to address long-term public safety needs and potential uh, do, and, and, and without needing to necessarily increase public safety uniform staffing. Um, note of the goals with regard to the public safety director, consistency of policies, a unified overall command structure, um, long-term planning, 
uh, administrative support for transitioning departments, um, supporting the emergency management, improving the emergency management structure, and the fresh eyes perspective uh, for departments. And I noted the potential implementation options, and I basically marked this up. This is the only place where I've made changes in the presentation. We looked at the full-time standalone director of public safety position um, and, and looked at it in the range of the existing public works um, director of public works uh, position. Um, the estimated cost based on the structure uh, and the compensation structure available in the public safety area between one hundred twenty-five dollars to $175,000 plus the cost of uh, benefits. So a substantial cost, obviously. Uh, looked at the combined position as well, which is similar to the finance director slash town accountant position that Ms. Rourke holds. Um, that's the recommended course of action, the chief of police with public safety director responsibilities. The uh, cost uh, uh, would be a $30,000 uh, plus uh, police department administrative overtime if necessary. Uh, fiscal year 2019 budget for the police department will include a recommendation for um, uh, $10,000 for overtime uh, if needed. Um, and I'll come back to the implementation um, with a little bit more detail. Uh, the part-time standalone position, a feeling uh, was that the part-time presence is unlikely to be as effective as having a full-time employee for what our major departments are uh, providing um, critical services. Uh, contracted services, the position has the responsibilities at the level, level of requiring an employee, uh, in my estimation, um, and the cost would likely exceed $30,000 to have a full-time presence for such a contractor. Um, so just with regard to uh, the implementation, um, right now the responsibilities would, are projected to be taken on by the Chief of Police. Uh, and again, that appointment is one that's made by the Town Administrator. Um, the decision today is really more about um, the implementation of uh, uh, the Public Safety Director. And I'm kind of showing the structure that I believe would, would make sense um, for us. The need for overtime, uh, it's unclear whether that would be needed or not. Uh, it's more a situation where there may be additional work required on the part of police personnel, and if that were the case, um, providing the uh, hours uh, to do so, uh, or uh, otherwise providing compensation if needed. And I think it is going to be, along with a lot of other components of this, things that we try to evaluate and respond to uh, over the course of the fiscal year, but I think in order to responsibly recommend this, I think we do need to account for the, the, the fact that there may be some redistribution occasionally of, uh, of workload. Um, I'm going to go to the budget narrative that I provided the board in the package, which will be in the um, budget recommendation coming forth to the board. Um, this is really just in the interest of transparency, what you'll see in the document once it's concluded tomorrow. Um, <coughs> The program description, again, implementation of the charter um, with a, a description there of the sections that were um, that, that call for this. Um, the objectives here that I've outlined, uh, three critical ones for fiscal year 2019, providing administrative oversight and guidance to new department heads, establishing independent civilian dispatch operation, freeing up uniform police and fire personnel to address requests or call for calls for service, and evaluating and recommending long-term uh, a long-term structure for emergency management. Uh, the proposed organizational structure would encompass the workload described below here, and you see it's the same graph that I provided the board in uh, the previous discussions um, relative to the administrative structure. Uh, no small capital projects, and again, the only line that will be in that uh, recommendation is the $30,000 uh, personal service uh, appropriation. And Mr. Chairman, I have included in the motion, because I feel the time is now to proceed, uh, to look for an implement implementation um, effective immediately. Uh, we uh, have already had transition in one major department, a uh, transition that uh, you know, I think by all accounts certainly um, uh, is going well, but this would provide a, a way to uh, offer additional support. We have forthcoming transition in the building department as well, with the um, building inspector uh, set to retire in the springtime. Um, and so um, my feeling is uh, that knowing that there are questions relative to fiscal year 2019, I'm sure, um, my recommendation will be we, we proceed with implementation now, um, given the uh, immediacy of the transitions that are occurring. I'm happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. the board, do you have any questions?
I appreciate you putting this together. I know you've given it a lot of thought, and, I, and certainly with this uh, this fiscal year ahead of us, uh, with the challenge of finding a new DPW director, a new town engineer, a permanent fire chief, and a new code enforcement officer, I think by having at least having this provisional fire chief in place and having someone to work with them to get them, uh, you know, have someone to work with does free up a little, a lot of your time to be able to focus on getting these p permanent positions filled, and I know it's going to be a tremendous amount of work. Um, I'm sold on this idea, and, and I appreciate the, the time you put into putting this presentation together. I think it spells it out pretty clearly. Yeah, uh, in fairness, uh, the Fire Union President Matt Carroll reached out to me today, and I spoke with him and two of his board members, and I do want to relay their uh, opinion on this they do not feel this position is necessary uh, and I hope I'm characterizing their my conversation with them correctly um, they feel that the provisional chief um, needs to be able to get his own administration in place without the, the further oversight <coughs> and that the money really could be spelt, spent better elsewhere that's gonna be appropriate <coughs> for this I'm personally for it but I just wanted to voice their concerns I told them I would voice their concerns tonight to the public um, but I think as our town grows we keep adding population our it's gonna put further crunch on our public safety officers and I think having someone over the top just kind of to take a little off uh, Mr. Gilberto your plate I think is very important because I, I think at times you can be overloaded with everything that's involved with your day-to-day -day operations if there's no more other questions we'll just take a motion uh, I have uh, some comments Mr. Chairman just uh, how many other communities have public safety directors around us of similar sized communities uh, so the position required under our or called for under our charter, I should say, not required, but the position called for under our charter is unique, no doubt about it. Um, I'm aware of one, possibly two other communities, larger communities than ours, that, that have uh, gone through and at times have had this structure in place. Uh, the one that, that comes to mind immediately is the city of Haverhill, which is a city obviously larger than ours. But there is no question it is not common. It's not common. Um, as I expressed that uh, was it the last meeting we talked about it briefly? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm not in favor of, uh, of uh, implementing the opportunity that's presented under the Charter. And uh, it has, in my recollection, never been suggested that we do this even prior to uh, our discussion of it this evening or even since our last, prior to our last meeting. Um, you know, I, Right now, if we look at who would come under the uh, public safety director, so fire, police, emergency management, building inspector, weights and measures, and the health department. Uh, I only see one area, one, one department where there has been um, a significant amount of discussion uh, by members of the board in relation to uh, how we operate, uh, maybe how we could do things differently and a little better um, and I think that the uh, proposal to put create another position and even if it's, even if it's through a stipend um, is, un is unnecessary you know there there's no doubt that there's a significant amount of uh, effort that needs to be put into man managing these departments but we have you know a good Police Department and Police Chief. We have a new fire chief, a provisional fire chief, uh, who has some pretty good ideas and recognizes that there may be some uh, room for modifications and need for a change of policies and procedures. Um, and I believe that there's some captains down there who are also interested in the position that express the same uh, interest in, in working with the administration to address those situations. And I think there should be an opportunity provided to the provisional chief and whoever the permanent chief is to to uh, work with the administration uh, under the direction of this board as to you know, what types of uh, changes in implementation and changes we'd like to see. Uh, I don't think we need uh, a public safety director to do that. You know, as far as the building inspection department, you know, if we're looking about uh, looking to automate things down there, I think that's more of an administrative function rather than a, a public safety issue. And uh, I don't think the requirement is needed. You know, weights and measures, we have one part-time person. The health department, we have a health director here who's doing a terrific job. Um, 
you know, he's come on board in the last year, and we've seen a lot of significant uh, changes uh, for, for the better. And uh, I think everything's just clicking along pretty well. So, um, you know, if the administration needs some additional administrative support, you know, then we should be talking about not just public safety, and we need some other areas too, then we should be talking about different types of positions. If we're talking about implementing a 911 um, system uh, manned by civilians, we've already explored that a little bit uh, under the previous, well, under Chief Harris, uh, more so than, uh, than Chief Warnock, and we have a, a blueprint for how to do that. And again, this isn't reinventing the wheel. There are a lot of communities that already have civilian dispatchers so that we can uh, call upon our neighbors uh, to assist us in implementing such a program. Uh, I didn't see anything in the budget proposal as far as implementing that. I mean, I guess it's, it's going to be a $300,000 cost to do so. And uh, what's the timeline that you would be charging this individual with to, for implementation in the, well, I say the two chiefs, so one and a half chiefs? Uh, to assist us in doing that. So uh, the timeline that I believe is going to be necessary is between 6 and 12 months from the beginning of the fiscal year, which would be put us right around April 1st, and um, I expect we're fine-tuning things, but I expect the recommendation will include um, funding to implement that on April 1st to, pr to provide us the lead time to, to get it off the ground. You know, there's no doubt that there may be some need for additional personnel for you know, fire and police, uh, and police department, and I think uh, implementing a civilian dispatch helps address that situation because it does free up uh, an individual in each department on each shift, and that would be extremely helpful in uh, addressing our needs. But I think what we're talking about here, as far as your proposal, is we're talking about a position now that's going to be paying in excess of $205,000 a year to an individual. Um, as I said before, I think that's excessive. I don't think that uh, it's warranted. I don't think there's a position in the town of North Reading that warrants that type of a, a salary. It may be the uh, most least, least expensive or cost-effective way to implement something here, but I think we really need to uh, seriously take a look at um, doing that. I mean, if we need a public safety director, then you need an individual to handle the situation if you need a full-time one. If you don't need a full-time one, you know, I haven't seen that either. So I, I disagree. I think uh, we have two, uh, you know, Chief Murphy is doing a terrific job with the police department. I think uh, Chief, uh, Provisional Chief Stats, again, needs an opportunity um, with some clear direction from the administration as to what we'd like to see uh, implemented, and I think this is a marvelous opportunity for him to prove himself uh, to the administration if he's looking for consideration for a permit chief. And uh, I think you have a willing set of officers in the fire department that are willing to work with the uh, new chief to help bring about some uh, necessary, what we believe to be necessary, uh, changes in how things are uh, imposed down there in relation to, you know, overtime and in staffing levels. Uh, I just think it's an unnecessary expenditure at this particular time. I think it's uh, the wrong structure. I think it's the, uh, uh, I, I just can't support it at this particular time. Now again, if you were coming to, to me and saying, you know, I, needed, uh, I need an assistant, administrative assistant to assist you in, in taking the workload off your desk, I'm behind you 100%, but not particularly in this particular case and at this particular cost and at this, uh, creating a position that's in excess of $200,000 a year. I, I can't good conscience support it. I don't find it necessary. And as far as implementing it immediately, uh, we didn't budget for it. We didn't discuss it uh, previously in any budget discussions. Uh, this has just come to us over the last couple of months, truly, uh, for consideration. I think the most appropriate place to discuss it would be in the budget discussion uh, for the new fiscal year. And. Um, let the new chief and fire chief do a job. So I, I'm not going to be in support of this at all. Any other comments? Mr. Messier? I've already expressed my concerns, and uh, you know, I guess rather than repeat what Steve has said, uh, I, I think it needs to be looked at in the budget process. I'm concerned about 
the salary level, even though you know the person is doing two jobs. Uh, you know, we're creating a position that is in the charter, and I personally, as chair of this board back a while ago, had recommended that we do something like that, but not from the point of view of uh, uh, doing it the way we were doing it, and it, and it becomes a budgetary issue. And uh, I think that uh, there's no need to rush into this from the point of view it can't that it can't wait until we get to reviewing the budget, which I think is going to be a big challenge this year, going into for next year's budget, and dealing with it as part of that. But I would prefer at this time and the evolution of the town to put those resources into an assistant town manager long before we fill that position. And, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of in a, uh, as soon, you know, as soon as you decide that you're going to put the uh, police chief in that role, you're creating a salary situation, and in my opinion, it's way out of line. And it's, it's got nothing to do with, you know, the, the chief, you know, obviously has done a great job for the town. And I can understand the issue of adding more responsibilities and paying that stipend. I understand that. But I think it's just the wrong approach to uh, putting someone in that position. And I don't think we have an emergency that we have to run off and deal with that. I really don't. Well, I, I disagree with you with one thing. You, we have a brand new provisional fire chief that just came in. And this is the time to put, I think, if we can fit it within the current operating budget, which it sounds like, based on what we heard this evening, it, he has the, the town administrator has the funding to fund whatever's remaining out of this year. Um, this year has money to fund, to get this started now. And I think there's a lot of value in it because you have a new person and then you have someone that's been existing for a while that can help them, integrate them, and then right out of the gate start to build a new approach, a new culture, a new administrative culture and approach. I think that's really important. And if you go back and you look at, and I'm not picking on the fire department, it's, I think there's a lot more. I don't think we're looking at emergency management and giving it enough credit. Um, but I'll just use one example because I think you, you keep on saying we have two good chiefs and we should just focus on that. Well, how has that worked out for us lately? You know, when you look at last year, just as an example, we had an overrun of $100,000 in overtime. This year, we're already at over, we're already at 70% use of overtime. We're only seven months into the year. I just think if we don't get our hands around this, you, know, you talk about you know, you know money, or well, we're spending money in this area, in this particular public safety area, that it's um, it's very concerning. And if you get, you get you get the reports every week, and in the one you got this week, I'm surprised I didn't hear from anybody when you read that report. I and mean, we have a massive overtime issue, and until we can get a new structure and get some oversight and some efficiencies built into this, we're going to have a problem. And you know, we don't have an execution issue in our fire department at all. None at all. They're the best in the country. I will say that again to anyone. They can execute well. But managing the money and how we're running it, is, we have a problem. And the, and the numbers tell that story. It's not me telling the story. It's every week. I get this. You get it. We only have 30% left in our overtime budget to go through five months. That's been concerning. This $30,000 is a drop in the bucket concern, part of this concern. And I think with this particular person going in charge of this public safety director, we're going to gain efficiencies. We're going to have savings far beyond $30,000. I think we should give it a chance. I'm going to support it. We've already supported it. I think the majority of the board already agree that we want to put this in place. And this tonight is about how we're going to execute it. And I think, you know, you've already voted against it before. No one's surprised on that. It's how he's presenting it and how he's going to budget it and how we're going to discuss it again. Yes, we'll discuss it again in a few weeks for FY 2019. Absolutely. No one's saying we shouldn't. And we can debate it some more then. And then, matter of fact, you're going to have the provisional chief and they're going to have um, uh, Chief Murphy at those meetings. And you can challenge them. And you can challenge the town administrator. And that's what we're here for. And, um, but I think you're making a, 
a, a naive decision on this. And Mr. Masseri, you of all people, you keep mentioning this salary. And I'm going to remind you of something. Not to put you on the spot, but you are the one that called us and you came here and you actually slammed your hand down on the table. And you can go back and look at the videos. When we were hiring Chief Murphy into the position, you called each and every one of us and said, because there was a lot of frustration about the salary that you negotiated with the town administrator at the time to bring him on. But you said, this is what it takes to bring in a chief like this. And I'm going to ask you to vote for it because this is what it takes to get a great chief. So that salary was established a long time ago. This is a new part of the process that we're adding. And for $30,000, I am just surprised that we have this much consternation on the board about it. And there's a lot of value that's going to come from it. Mr. Schultz. Um, Mr. Gilberto, and maybe Ms. Ruck, the finance director, I, I'm not sure which one of you guys are best to direct this at. If we spend $30,000 on, on this position, do you guys think we will see a savings that will justify this position? I'm not sure which one of you two to direct this to. So, <coughs> uh, you know, I don't want to stand here and, and you know, make representations that we don't necessarily know at this point in time. But I do think that the goal is to look at efficiencies and identify where there's an ability to do things more efficiently, which one could assume would result in a reduction of costs. Um, I don't want to go beyond that at this point in time because I don't know that it would be responsible on my part, but uh, I do think it's fair to say that I, I make this recommendation expecting that we'll be able to look back at it at some point in time down the road, and not too far down the road, and be able to say, yes, there was an ability to do things better in a, ba in a way that not only addressed perhaps a cost, but addressed you know, uh, well-being for our employees as well. So um, I think there is an ability uh, you know, what those things could be. I, you know, it's hard for me to say right now. Uh, I would so want to put your um, expectation of the position will quote unquote pay for itself through savings? Uh, I'm not going to, I'd like to be able to sit here and say, yeah, it is. Uh, I think that that's uh, um, a, certainly a strong possibility, but I don't know that I could responsibly say that right now. And you know, when I say that, again, I'm trying to be fully transparent with the board and the discussions along the way on this. You're going to see a budget recommendation for me as soon as tomorrow that will show uh, substantial costs. And part of it is rooted in the information that uh, Mr. Prisco identified earlier relative to um, the overtime costs that we've seen for this current fiscal year. Um, Will there be an opportunity to reduce those costs? Yeah, possibly. Um, I think that's our hope, but I, I don't want to stand here and make that commitment um, not knowing it. But I think that, you know, from where we are at right now, um, this opportunity and taking these steps are important because this is the best time for us to explore it. Mrs. Um, Minupelli. I think there's a substantial benefit to us having this position and having I think you, you've sort of designated someone that you want to sort of shepherd people through the budget process. It, and I would like to see it. I, I think it's a great idea and I would echo, I think I would echo Select Namasiri. I would like to see it be a full-time type of a position, not something part-time. I understand our fiscal constraints right now only allow it to be this sort of, um, part-time type of a thing and and this individual is willing to take that extra duties on d to your knowledge yes and also I I also think um, I, I would like to see it as a full-time down the line but it's it's reminding me of our discussions or our debate about having a deputy town administrator versus an HR director and I, I would like to see this implemented because it takes something out of your hands that really, I think, belongs in some, a public safety official's hands to do and frees you up to do things so that you can achieve your, your goals and your mission for the town, which I'm sure you have many. And I also think that it's important to have someone who knows everyone, has institutional knowledge, has historical knowledge, who's able to work with everybody and I think has, from, uh, from what I understand, has a proven track record here. So I think, it's, I think it's good and I'm in favor of it and I'm supporting the proposal. You're not asking us for a deputy or I'm using the wrong, as an assistant town manager. But I remember this is what it sounded like the last time. 
when we were talking about getting you an HR director. Your request was for an HR director. And I think I debated you about that. That's not what he was, he wasn't right. asking you for an assistant, he's asking you for this. I think we have the capability to do it's it. It's okay that we're, we have differences of opinions on this. It's, it's mm -hmm. not unhealthy, it's, it's healthy. And but I understand the constraints. I would ultimately like to see it be a full-time if, if there is a but way to financially town, do town that. The manager is going to be far more than $30,000, and I think we're going to get a lot of value for this $30,000. I think we, we can give it a shot, and if it's not working out, then you know, he can come back here and modify his plan and go forth. But I think the town ministry is making a recommendation he thinks is best that he feels for his organization to be successful. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. I just think ultimately uh, on a temporary basis, if this works out, I, I would like to see it be a full time. And I think by, by approving this, that would be the expectation down the line for me is that you're not just going to keep someone in this sort of part time capacity. You're really going to let someone do this on a full time basis down the line. I would say, Mr. Chairman, through you, that yes. it would certainly would, I think, they'd be any of our <laughs> preference to be able to proceed in that fashion with a, a full-time position. But um, I'm trying to balance all of the competing interests and all of the priorities that we deal with year in and year out. Um, and, um, you know, looking at our alternatives based on where we are at today, this would appear to be the most feasible step for us to take to implement this. If there's no more discussion. I think like Ms. Herworth had a comment. You have to come to the podium or to the mic if you don't mind. I'm sorry. The folks at home cannot hear you. Well, you're right here. I can ask you. <laughs> 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 you got to say this. Uh, through you, Mr. Yes, Chairman, please. to the town administrator. Um, this would be a separate department, a freestanding department of its own? It will be, yes. You'll okay. see a, a new department entitled Public Safety Administration in the budget recommendation. Hence, um, the $30,000 would not become part of a police chief's salary. This would be a totally separate department with a separate salary entity. Am I correct? Uh, it, it, the, se the compensation will not be appropriated through the police department budget. Okay. It will be appropriated through the public safety, recommended to be appropriated through the public safety department. Okay, thank you. Mr. O'Leary. But it does get added to a salary for retirement purposes. And yes. So, um, yes, sir. Most of the discussion that we're, we're having here centers around overtime, and overtime specifically in the fire department budget. And we're obviously been wrestling with it for a, a long time. And we're somewhat frustrated with our inability to harness it appropriately and, and manage it to whatever expectations we're putting on the, the town administrator. And it just appears to me that we're insulating the administrator from a decision that he has to ultimately make anyway um, by putting someone in between he and the department. You know, to me, the opportunity that we have now with you know, new chief administrative uh, administration down there at the fire department provides us with that opportunity. And again, uh, the provisional status and the uh, incumbent that's in the position right now will have an opportunity to prove himself and willing to work with the administration to achieve our goals. I don't believe uh, that we need to uh, address the situation with additional personnel overseeing the fire department. I don't believe that a new structure in the town of North Reading, which deviates from most every other community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts of similar size or even larger, uh, which has been tried in other communities and undone, you know, is going to work. You know, if you're looking to address this on a temporary basis, I don't think this is the, the solution. I think what we need to do is be very upfront uh, with uh, the members of the department, the collective bargaining unit, uh, and try to achieve our goals together. Uh, it's no secret. I mean, during the course of the last negotiations, um, they're well aware as to what our concerns are and what uh, we feel needs to be done. Uh, some of it may result in 
you know, grievances or arbitration or even lawsuits, but that's not going to change even with a public safety director if we're uh, going to try to achieve the goals that are being set out here. I just, uh, I don't believe it should be implemented <coughs> per year. I think uh, it should be debated uh, during the budgetary um, sessions that we're going to be having, and, and I, I don't think it's necessary, and I disagree. Mrs. Helber. Um, I, think, I think that it would be wrong to categorize this new position as supervision for the fire department. They will also be super, you know, uh, the administrator in charge of the health department, the building department, emergency management, as well as his own department. I, I, and I, I really don't, I would hate to think that the change in um, the chief at the fire department or the change in the administration there has, has caused this suggestion to come up. I, I think that um, a public safety director can do a lot of things besides help ease a new acting fire chief um, into his job. I think there are plenty of people in the fire department that can do that. Um, and that might actually be better. I do, however, think that it's a very good way of testing the waters with a known entity that we trust, that knows the community, and that is very smart in seeing how something such as a public service director works for this town. That's it. Anyone else? Many people. And I, I just want to add, it, it, for me, again, I've said this publicly, it isn't about overtime. I agree with that. If someone is performing the duties and they're performing overtime, they not only deserve to be paid for that, they're entitled to be paid for that. That is not the issue, I think, that, ne that this position is meant for. There's so much turnover. There w there's been so much shift in personnel. I think s someone to sort of shepherd all of these departments, I think adding in that sort of additional leadership role not only will help us, it will help all of those department heads, and it's also going to help our town administrator. So I would like to move on, but I, I will just want to end it on this one thing. It is, is not just about the fire department. I, I think we have a massive hole in our organizational structure associated with emergency management. You know, at some point, we have to have a disaster planning, emergency preparation, uh, preparedness. I mean, we, we need to have those types of things that we don't have a good grasp on today, uh, and <coughs> as well as integrate the health department into uh, the entire organization from top to bottom. So. So I, I think we've discussed enough. I'd like to just go to a vote. We have a few other things on the agenda I'd like to get to. So make a motion? Please. Mr. Chairman, I move to accept the information plan for a public safety director as presented by the town administrator and to establish a position for fiscal year 2018, effective February 13, 2018. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. No. Passes three to two. The next thing is the, the estate of Charles A. Anderson. Mr. Chairman. Please. Through you. You had in your um, packet information that came to us relative to this estate. And uh, we are informed that the town stands to be a beneficiary of this estate. Uh, Selectwoman Manupelli pointed out to me that we did not include the citation for petition for formal adjudication, which is another document that goes with this, but what it effectively indicates is that there are uh, two folks who are recognized as petitioners and we are assenting to them acting in that fashion, the two individuals being a Richard Hughes, 152 Haverhill Street, North Reading, and Marilyn Brodeur, 5 Locker Lane, Woburn, Massachusetts. So thank you to Selectman Mignapelli for advising me to make the board aware of uh, who th we are assenting to serving to adjudicate this. <laughs> I noticed there wasn't any. James, <laughs> and, and, and Jane, you can turn the heat on. I will um, I'll also just note that um, we're in the early stages of uh, going through the, um, the probate of this estate, and I expect that there will be additional information coming back to us relative to any potential benefit the town may draw down the road, but uh, too early to speculate on that at this point in time. But the reason it's here is because we have been named as a beneficiary, the town has, 
um, and uh, the, it appears that uh, the, the interest we have is for uh, resources to be made available, if given to the town, to benefit veterans and their families. But uh, we'll talk more about that at a future point in time once the estate's been settled and we know exactly have, what. I'm, I'm sorry, I just, no, it's kind of all connected. I think I have a conflict on this because I okay. believe the Union Congregational Church, which I'm a member, is also a recipient under the will. I believe so. And yes. I am on the committee handling that with my church. So I'm going to recuse myself from this particular item. I think I'd have a conflict of interest. So, and, and for the record, I believe that the will may not have been in the packet, so the select women would not have known that. <laughs> so, so I apologize, <laughs> Mr. Schultz. I, when I heard Mr. Hughes, our Reverend, I, 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 I'm not generally in the interest of trying to create conflicts. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. So is the will available, Michael? Uh, it is, yes, and I can circulate it to the board if you'd like. Um, but uh, I so believe that the that that that. that, that that church and perhaps other churches are named as beneficiaries, if I remember correctly. So, what would you, what are you looking to accomplish this evening? Is there a motion? So there's a motion in there that's uh, been provided, which authorizes you to sign the assent so that this can all move forward, um, and the, the appropriate processes to probate the estate can take place. Uh, if the board members don't have any questions, uh, I think we're good. Please. Mr. Chairman, I move to authorize the chairman to sign the assent and waiver of notice and waiver of sureties for the estate of Charles Albion Anderson. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Uh, I'm going to thank the family for this generous donation and commitment to the community. It's wonderful. So with that said, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And one abstention, Mr. Schultz. You can come back in. Nope. Approve the NUE policy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, are we not taking up item 11? Did I miss something? The town meeting. Oh, I did. I went right by it. I'm sorry. It's a little dark in here. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, review town meeting schedule to discuss warrant articles. Mr. Chairman, through you, this is a new step. Um, Perhaps it was something that was done in the past prior to my tenure, but in my tenure, generally the board does not have much discussion of the warrant, the warrant articles, or otherwise uh, related topics until we uh, have received the warrants from departments. And so um, one of the outcomes from um, the past couple of years, preparations for town meeting, was we put together a pretty extensive spreadsheet. I say we. Karen, Marlon, and my office put together the spreadsheet with input from the finance director, the town clerk, and the town planner um, to ensure accuracy. And you see there's a number of steps that we put in there that are required to make all of this happen. I think the charter reads that the town administrator is responsible, but there's probably a half dozen parties that are involved in getting us to that point of the town meeting being ready to proceed in June and then again in October. So what we thought we would do was just outline all of this, kind of call it, the, to, call it to the attention of the many boards and committees in, here in town that might not have direct access to a department staff person that um, the warrant is open for articles to be submitted for the board to consider. The deadline is in March, March 16th, do I have that correct? Yes, 19th, excuse me, March 19th. Um, and this also uh, was done to uh, provide the board an opportunity to have any discussions about warrant articles that it may wish to submit so that we could begin a dialogue with town council to properly craft such articles. Um, and that really was the extent of it. I had a couple things I'd like to share. Um, first and foremost is the, the town warrant itself. And I think we talked about it at the last town meeting that it's probably in need of a rewrite. Um, you know, this front page, if you read it, it goes back to probably early, uh, maybe late 60s. But I would like to put together a subcommittee to look at maybe rewriting it, the front page, adding an acronym list, adding some instructions. Uh, I grabbed a copy of the one at Andover. They had some nice things in there about how the town meeting should run. But I, I think it's we're at a time now where we need to update our warrant. Uh, I'm not sure how you feel about it. I just wanted to present that tonight and see if there was somebody willing to join me in a subcommittee to sort of draft a, a, a new look to it. And maybe we won't have it done for June, but um, you know, certainly at some point I'd like us to update it to become more 21st century looking and oriented. Uh, add some color. Add some color. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Great. Yeah. Pictures. Um, took a second. Yeah. Cut to this. Right, of course, whatever we draft up, we'll bring to the board. Um, Mr. Gilberto, did you run it by the town clerk that 
this is something I'd like to look You know what, I apologize, but the day got away from me. I did not get to talk with the uh, If you could just counselor. ask her, if, you know, and, and maybe she would like to be part of that discussion. I think she would. Are you going to be proposing pro and con microphones, too, like that? Negative. <laughs> I never seen anything pretty like organized, that though. I, the best yeah. one was that was the person that was at, was at one microphone. They made him want to the yeah. other <laughs> to say their con or whatever. Uh, that was class. Yeah. Um, I have two other things. Um, Although I did like their audio visual and how they handled yes. They did a fantastic job yeah. with that. Yeah. That, was that was a very big gym. That was very impressive. Very very impressive. Huh? Everything else was great. They just voted wrong. Yeah, they you know just what? Voted wrong. We can bring that up. But that maybe was see if we can find some auto increased automation. But that was um, I like that. They idea. were very good at uh, I don't know, know how they did it. But we would have to figure it out though. Your SSBC, how we could actually do they that. They just had some skilled people who knew how to use the equipment. This. Yeah, that wrote, that the way they were able to design those end caps, I guess you call it, on the side screens, of the stage. Yeah. Those yeah. are great screens. But we'll work on that too. Those so were good. Mrs. Menu Paul and I will work on the rewrite and uh, bring it up to the 21st century. Other thing I wanted to propose for a Warren article is, um, you know, the town administrator title has always kind of bothered me. And you look at what the town administrator does and the authority he has. Um, would the board be would you object to going forward with requesting a, a charter change to call him a town manager? I think calling him a town manager fits with what he does. Town desire. You know, well, sorry, it would be good. But I, I don't know. I know it's administrative, but I, I think we, it's worthy of us making that change. Um, it's one thing I'd like the board to consider. There was another thing, um, I had two or three different things on here. Um, town meeting, we talked about October town meeting. We talked about maybe changing October town meeting. And I know there was some objection to it, and I did talk to attorney Klein about this subject and I asked him I said what if we made a charter change to the state that the Board of Selectmen has to determine a month a day in the month of October for town meeting rather than say it's the first Monday of the month or the second Monday month he said that's absolutely 100% acceptable we can do it um, without a full charter I mean you, you suggested a couple of charter changes I'm just wondering at what point do we trigger a charter commission which is a long well he's administrative process. and I asked him that yeah. and he said this town administrator to go to town manager he said absolutely it fits more in line with his title and it's actually his authority by making this change from town administrator the town manager doesn't give him any less authority but fits more in line with the title that matches his description um, so he didn't think that would cause it he didn't think um, getting rid of the first Monday in October to give us some flexibility but we would have to determine a date in October at some point, probably in, I think, the August time frame or something like that. So it would be different each year? Well, it would yeah. come down with the board thing. If you look at, you talk to the town administrator, or you talk to the finance director, and they would say, you know, we, we would like to do it the second week in October. I think it fits better in line with the things that they have going on. It just gives this board that flexibility. We would have a range. We have to have it fall in, right? In the month. In, okay, we're in the you, month. You met, 31 day month, I believe. Yeah, it would have to fall within one of those 30 days. That could be on a weekend if you want it to be. Uh, it has to fall in the month of October. Um, just gives you some flexibility. Because as I said before, and I don't think anybody objected to the idea that from June town meeting to October town meeting, it comes very quickly. And it just gives you some flexibility. And then the third one, uh, I had mentioned that other towns are going through it. Um, they're changing their board name. And I spoke to Mrs. Uh, Mignopelli about it because really it affects her more than anything. You know, we're a selectman, board of selectmen, and a lot of a lot of towns, and Darren did say to me that a tremendous amount of city, I mean, a lot of towns are going to select board and thought this is the time to, for us to consider. If we're making these little administrative changes, um, and he didn't think any of that would trigger a charter review. So. So we have selectmen and select women. Yeah, we would just call select board, and then we would just like congressman and congressman. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're doing uh, KMP is doing this now for a lot of towns, and we're making these changes. It kind of goes in line with 21st century, trying to clean up a little bit here and there, take us to the next phase of North Reading. I know it's a lot at you, throwing it at you, but we don't have to make a decision tonight. I just want to throw those three ideas out there, Mr. O'Leary. And I know there's a subcommittee working 
locally to address our plowing of sidewalks on Route 28. Yes, I didn't know about that. I just I learned think, about that. You know, and, and again, the I board expressed some concern in relation to the enforceability, the resources that are being expended to try and enforce the bylaw. Is it workable? Not workable. Mm -hmm. um, does it need to be tweaked, or should this? The town just pick up the tab and plow the sidewalk since we're doing some of it anyway. You know, to me, it, we shouldn't necessarily have to rely on a citizen's petition to address it. We can partner with them, but I think I would like to see something that this board could support in order to address the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what everyone else's thought was, but um, it was a nuisance. It's a nuisance I have a, to deal I have with. A thought. Um, Actually, yeah. I haven't done one last week. You're coming to fill you in. Well, I'm just going to share my thought, and then maybe it'll tie in. I think that we should take it in a little different step. Are we committed to sidewalks on Route 28? And if we are, we should put our money where our mouth is and put put sidewalks down Route 28. By having this path where there is no sidewalks, it pushes them out to the road, go down two or three lots, and then you get back onto a sidewalk. I'd like to make the commitment first to put those sidewalks in and then implement a plan that gets them plowed. Uh, because even if we plow them, Steve, I think we still put people at risk by this section with those sidewalks. Oh, I, I understand that, but right now we're, we're fining people for not taking care of what's in front of them. We send our sidewalk plow to do what's town-owned land, go out in the street, go around private property, and continue on. To me, it's, we're sending the people I out know. there anyway. You know, so yep. we should at least maintain what's there consider maintaining what's there and if we're going to you know address you know the walkability of route 28 you know that's going to have to be a concept with the state which is not going to be an easy task I don't believe but uh, and again very costly uh, to do but that being said I think what we're dealing with right now is not necessarily fair not necessarily economically feasible I mean we're wasting police resources knocking on doors Great. and handing things out. You know, hey, how about 24 hours? You did it, you didn't. We are out there doing our property because, you know, we're saying if we're gonna force other people to do it, we're doing our portion of it, but then we're sending our plow and going right around. I, I kind of defies logic. I just can't believe how easy it was to implement a drone bylaw and we haven't been able to straighten out this snow bylaw issue. Snow removal. But there's, I don't think there, that one. there's, <laughs> there's a citizen's petition. We would just, I was just yeah. mentioning with Selectman um, Schultz. There is a citizen's petition that's being circulated to get a warrant article to put sidewalks on 28 at the moment. So it's obviously you're you're in the collective conscience raising that as as an issue. So maybe there's something we can do to. Well, I, I think that. we need to address our current bylaw and how it isn't working well. Agreed. For anybody. I don't think it meets reality. Um, you so, know. you know, we committed to doing something about it first, and then we could address the, the sidewalk. The building of sidewalks is going to be very costly. And, I know. Um, you know, maybe it needs to be addressed, but... May, can we do it on one side? What if we made a commitment to just one side? Would that be... Good luck. I, don't know. I mean, when you check some of the properties, it's. But a, what's worrisome to me is we plow them, and then we do still put people out onto Route 28 to get around those areas that we don't in the sidewalks. There's no TPs. You know, that's that's concerning to me. That's sure. why I would have a hard time with any bylaw. But, Mr. Schultz, go ahead. If I may, I did meet with the business community last Thursday, and um, Eric Evans is leading a group. That, um, attorney uh, Jerry Venezia is helping them out as well. They are going to put together a citizen's petition, and it's going to be, we technically have two snow bylaws on the books right now. We have the one that was been on for years, and the one that was passed at town meeting probably, was it Steve, about a year ago maybe? A year, year and a half ago? What have you? Yeah, There's technically two bylaws. Nine. They're going to look to repeal both of them um, and start anew. And, uh, you know, I, I just think it's tough because a lot of their plow companies that they hire for their driveways, they're getting two lanes of 28 dumped onto their sidewalks. A lot of their plow contractors don't have the equipment like the town does to do this. And, and it, as Selectman O'Leary correctly pointed out, the thing's going up and down just picking up the plow when it goes by the businesses. It's going from Reading to Andover on both sides. So I think if we could support the business community on this, I think it would be a great win-win for everybody. But in order to do that, we need to 
repeal or revise our current bylaw because, again, we have an obligation to enforce the bylaws that are on the books, which is what we talked about last week. God bless you. God bless you. Um, and there's two on the books right now. Yeah, so we have an obligation because of the law of the land right now. But I think before the next season comes around, we should address it in some fashion. Uh, so you want to try and put something on for June? No. I don't know. They're going to be putting something on. And I told them we would obviously make a recommendation as a board. But I think we should you know, find out what they're going to be proposing. But in the meantime, the administration should assist us in trying to come up with some sort of a, a viable solution, if there is one, uh, to either augment what they're going to do, or we should adopt what they're proposing and propose it ourselves and be the sponsor of the article. I think the board should be sponsoring an article. If we, if we acknowledge there's a problem, then let's don't wait for someone else to propose a solution. I can check with, uh, with Attorney Venezia. I know he's yeah. representing so that group. Can we take the action once between now? What do you need the warrant articles, Mike? March 19th is March 19th. the deadline that we've issued. However, the board won't sign the final town meeting warrant until the first week of May. So that's four that we just discussed. So we want a proposed text of their petition to see if we can support it. Well, maybe. maybe. I, don't know, I don't know what their text yeah, is. Again, maybe. I was at, no, to I was see at, if we I can mean, support I was it. A, I was yeah. at the meeting a couple of weeks ago with them. I didn't, wasn't able to make the one last Thursday. But uh, again, it's a, it's a problem that we've recognized discussed and now we shouldn't ignore it we should just so we just want to see a proposed text to see if we can if we can support it or not you know or yeah yeah i mean just take a look at the uh, snow removal on the streets that get plowed to related to the schools mm -hmm. right and there's poles in the way mm -hmm. and there's piles of snow sure. and I, I think when you look at route 28 you, you really need to take a look at what would need to be plowed? What's in the way? And can you put a plan together to do it incrementally while you think about maybe putting sidewalks on, on all of Route 28? But before you even do that, you ought to look at what you want to do with all of Route 28. Yeah, I think and make it be, part of the total plan. That's going to be part of the master plan with yeah, curb right. cuts and all the rest. And I think if we can start yeah. spending money with granite curb and all the rest, and all of a sudden, it's not part of a master yeah. plan. Right. Maybe you're spending money. Yeah, you know, you're right. Unwisely. You're right. So the curb cuts are huge on Route 28 right now. Um, again, if sewage ever comes in, then the curb yeah. cuts are going to become less of an issue because you can share curb well, cuts. We certainly might. I, I agree. The number one goal should be, though, the, to look at how this is impacting our police and, you know, meet reality. It should be realistic. And, and also, how is it impacting our, our business community, again, who... Uh, in the way of services that they require from the town are far less than a residential property for the most part. Uh, they don't send kids to schools, you know. Um, and we don't require residences to clear the sidewalks in front of their houses. Yep. Uh, and that's the other challenge, because we have houses on Route 28, right? And they're not required. They're not required they're not to affected. do so. And we're doing those sidewalks already. Okay. Andrew's got it. Um, and then those other three that I brought up, anybody have any strong objections? We, I'll work on something and put it together and send it out. What was the first one again? The first one was try and change the title from town administrator to the town manager. The other town, was October date. And, um, the, the October name of the, date. The name of our board. And the name of the board oh, from the selectman to select board. And then the town meeting schedule, if there was some flexibility in just giving her a specific day and just saying a day in October to give us some flexibility. If we need to buy a week to help us be more prepared for town meeting. And I don't have any burning desire on any of those. If there's any strong objection, I'll move on. But I don't have any burning desire either, but if they want to talk about it, fine. <laughs> I mean, the October thing, you know, works. Okay. Better. The name of the board? You guys happy with the way it is? I don't know. You know what you're so Why don't you tell does me Mrs. Major Pelly have strong feelings on it? Uh, I, I think it's a good idea to move us into the 20th century at this point. Yes. 20th century? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so not even aiming for 21st. But I have Mr. to, yeah, I just say this though, so I have to interrupt. So a small you. incremental <laughs> step. <laughs> Select board, a lot of the con Conquer did a Brookline did this. Step. Tons of communities but that Kate, are. Tell, come on, let's just talk quickly. Andover. <laughs> well, we, gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> gentlemen, gentle, gentlemen, please rise. And I stood with you guys. I admit it. But then, but to, I told him to sit down to, as we left, to say thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. I'm you know. sorry. I <laughs> Never I identified as a male. Trying to make but, it light. <laughs> No, I mean it's it's more of a it's more of yeah. Let's usher this into the twentieth century at this point, you know. Well, I think for now on we we should refer to you 21st. as selectman. I said that when uh, I first joined it. It was at the proper way to refer. Why don't I just refer to you, Kate? Well, we could. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I mean, I I think you know we do it with school committee school committee members. You know, select board member. Um, you could. They they call them boards. You know, select boards now at this point. You know. In the, in the definition in the statute at selectmen, but in the definition for town administrator, it's executive secretary of town administrator. So they're not really substantive changes, but I think it, it has a meaning to change it, to a recognize a little bit more Malden diversity. Yet, the 20th century yet? <laughs> yes. We'll move us along. <laughs> Let's see what we can do to bring us into 21st century. Anything else? No, I think I think that's a great idea. I I think the title changes. You know, I think these are not really consequential. I just think with the meeting date, I think is more. I think people that go, are here and go to a lot of town meetings bank on the specific date. So I think we would have to decide it way earlier. Yeah, with advance notice. What well, you could earlier. move October. You could move it out to two weeks. It would give us more time coming out of summer, and it would also not, you know, move too close to the issue that the town finance director has to deal with in terms of getting everything ready, getting input back from the state, getting the tax rates set and everything else. So By not picking a, a day, though, I think gives us a lot more flexibility. And we can make it a, um, a goal of the board to try to do it the second week of October stick to that but I think giving you that flexibility to move it out a day or two or even a week for, un so for unforeseen reasons I think it's why not and you don't ever have to worry about going back for a job change again uh, it's there do you have any objection to that Mr. Gilberto? No I, I don't have any objection to it I, and I, I apologize I was not able to speak with the town clerk but I, I certainly would recommend that we get her input with regard oh. to it I'll draft something up on all of these and we can make a decision as yeah. we get closer. Right, right. I think the point in bringing it up was start the conversation now <clears throat> and um, you know, come to the determination that the board feels is most comfortable yeah. with in a timely fashion. And how do you feel about your name, you know, title change? Uh, I, I, I just make sure the check clears. Call it what you want. <laughs> well, I just think, you know, Speak to my agent over yeah, here. <laughs> trying to make some change to fit in line with I, I, I do think that if you, I, I think that if you did an, an analysis of the responsibilities as they exist today, you would find that they are more in line with the position entitled town manager than town administrator. Yes, I do. That's what council said, so. I'm just repeat what council had said to me. Okay, next on the agenda, uh, vote to approve the NUE. Policy. Mr. Chairman, through you, I'll just briefly describe um, what's going on with regard to this. It's a request for the board, board to ratify a vote that it uh, already has initially taken in executive session earlier this evening. This is an agreement that, per, uh, that governs the compensation and benefits for uh, many of our uh, long-term department heads and other uh, non-unionized long-term staff. Um, they have been without an agreement since the end of fiscal year 2015, uh, on June 30th of 2015. Um, there have been ongoing negotiations with uh, multiple groups that have concluded in the past, let's say, 12 months or so, and uh, we uh, were able to reach a tentative agreement largely through the efforts of Human Resources Director Bob Collins um, and the bargaining team um, representing the, these employees. And what this agreement effectively does is it calls for uh, wage increases over um, a series of um, five fiscal years, fiscal year 15 through fiscal year 2019. Um, it also includes a series of reforms, um, including uh, limiting retroactive payments to employees who are on the payroll as of the date of ratification and or, and those who have retired. Um, 
adjust the provision of overtime uh, to employees for hourly employees. Um, clarifies that uh, payment for accrued comp time, uh, which right now is payable upon uh, any sort of separation from the town, including resignation, um, to make it so that only those payments only take place upon retirement. Um, reducing the amount of acu uh, accumulated comp time, comp compensation time to 35 hours, and eliminate the payment for unused personal time upon leaving uh, employment. Um, these are, uh, th there's also a uh, elimination of the payout for uh, sick leave uh, upon termination. Right now, the employee who was terminated would be eligible for 50% or 50% of up to 75 days upon retirement, even if terminated, this would eliminate that possibility, but still leave it in effect for employees who uh, retire um, uh, uh, from employment. Uh, reduced payout to an employee's estate for sick time, which is currently at 100% of that sick time to 50%. Eliminate the sick leave bonus of an additional day every six months uh, or two days per year, which is currently in place, um, eliminating that bonus. Um, reforming our extended sick leave, which right now is sort of an all or nothing situation where the town administrator is required to uh, um, determine whether to grant a, uh, an allocation of time that's based solely on the individual's length of employment. Um, this would allow us to make a more measured agreement with the employee as to what the appropriate amount of time is. Um, in some instances, it could be somebody who only needs a week, but they're entitled to multiple weeks. Um, I, I would find myself in a situation with a difficult decision to make. Now I have the latitude to be able to create something that's less than that amount, which seems a lot more reasonable and a more pr prudent use of the taxpayer's resources. Um, it also includes a reform to uh, what, is, what was termed paternity leave, which will now be um, basically identified as uh, FMLA uh, leave required under the federal, uh, federal law. Um, I want to just note that these are employees who are performing some of our uh, most important responsibilities uh, at the department le head level um, through um, the administrative level as well. And many of them are long-term employees and they have been more than patient with the process that we've gone through in negotiations. And I, I can't stress enough the professionalism with which they have handled themselves uh, in this town hall and in other buildings as these negotiations have uh, proceeded. And I, I want to thank them, all of those employees, for their professionalism. I want to thank Jim Nicola and Maureen Stevens, who represented this group at the table, working with Bob Collins, and then uh, when looking at implementation with Liz Rourke, uh, and uh, also, uh, to a certain extent, Laurie Ann Galvin. Um, those individuals made this all come together uh, in a way that I think was appropriate for the employees and appropriate for the town based on its long-term goals relative to legacy benefits. And um, I know they are pleased that we have the opportunity to resolve this, and I am pleased as well that we're able to resolve this for them. And I'd ask for the board's ratification. And with that, if there's no comments, we'll take a motion. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I move to ratify approval of the personal policy employment agreement for non-union personnel for the period of July 1, 2014 through June 30, 2019. Second. I need a motion to second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. We have uh, two copies to sign. There are, yes. Thank you. The appointments and reappointments. The detailed constable and the East Middlesex two Mosquito spots. Control Rep. Mr. Chairman, I move to place the nomination of the following name for appointment as a detailed constable for a term to expire on December 31, 2019. Is, uh, James McCormick. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? How many do we have? Do you know? This is five. Detailed constable. Oh, this is second. Yeah, this, this, is second. this will be our second, yes. This will be our second. Process serving constable, we have four, I believe, at this point, and this is our second, second detail second constable. Detail. The other special being, police constable, I think, is the title. Yes, the other is uh, Mr. Berg. Mr. Who? Berg. Berg. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Mosquito Control Rep. Mr. Chairman, I move to place into nomination the following name for reappointment as East Middlesex Mosquito Control Representative for a term to expire on December 31, 2019. Uh, Mr. Robert Bracey. Second. 
A motion and a second by Mr. Masseri. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Legal bills for December. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills for December 2017 in the amount of $3,999.63 as follows. Coltman and Page, PC General, $26.50 and $0.63. Cents. Coltman and Page Labor, $1,349 for a total of $3,999.63. And motion, second. do I have a second? I have a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Minutes? Minutes of the January 22nd, 2018 regular and executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the January 22, 2018 regular session minutes as written. Second. In a motion, a second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the January 22, 2018 executive session minutes as written. Second. Second. And any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Town Administrator's report. Mr. Chairman, uh, bear with me as uh, I have the report that was included in my uh, packet, and I also have a supplement that was included in the scan document that I put in to the uh, packet this evening. Uh, so first, the Attorney General has approved the social host bylaw, approved at October Town Meeting. Uh, there was a report from her office that was included. The Police Department is following up on the issue of recovering the fines with Town Council. As an update regarding snow and ice removal expenses to date, um, we have expended $309,017. This amount reflects the appropriation of $175,000 plus $134,017 of the $300,000 deficit reserve that we carry in the fiscal year 2019 revenue and expenditure plan. And that number we believe is fairly accurate through last Wednesday's storm, if I understand from Mr. Lafferty correctly. Um, I'll come back to the two separations in employment uh, by virtue of retirement in just a moment. Um, oh, maybe I should do that. Bear with me one moment, Mr. Chair. So Mr. Chairman, um, I said, think the board members are all aware we have two longtime employees who are going to be uh, retiring in the coming months. Um, town engineer Mike Sorgan has notified me of his intention to retire effective March 31st. Um, Mr. Sorgan was hired June 15th, 1998 as town engineer and has served with us in that capacity since that date. Uh, prior to that, he served seven years as a town engineer in Amesbury. Um, he, uh, holds a bachelor's degree of science and master's in science of science and civil engineering um, and is also a registered professional engineer here in Massachusetts, Maine and in Maine and in New Hampshire and has multiple certifications and he has served the town dutifully as uh, acting public works director on multiple occasions during periods of transition or absence of the director. Um, Mrs. Sorgan has had a hand in um, every public works road project that's happened in town here since 1998. I'm sure he has commented on every subdivision or other development project that's taken place. And he has been um, the uh, source to resolve everyday problems for probably hundreds of residents uh, over the years of his time here um, relative to the town's infrastructure. He's often the person who's charged with coming up with a solution where there is no easy solution facing us. And uh, he has addressed that. And that is in addition to his responsibilities for the town representing its interests relative to it, whether it's development or public works projects. So I want to thank Mr. Sorgan for his service, and I want to recognize that he served um, dutifully for the town for um, nearly 20 years. The second retirement is Building Inspector James DeCola, who will be retiring at the end of April with almost 30 years of service to the town. Mr. DeCola was hired April 1st, 1988 as Assistant Wire Inspector. In September 14, 1992, we became the alternate building inspector. 
Effective July 12, 1994, he was full-time both as a part-time, as both the part-time wiring inspector and part-time building inspector, so he had shared responsibilities. In October 21, 2002, he became the permanent inspector of buildings. He holds eight certifications, including building inspector, building commissioner, electrical inspector, and master electrician. Similar to uh, Mrs. Sorgan, Mr. DeCola's responsibilities have um, touched not only um, every building constructed in town during that time to some extent or another, but he has also been the source of uh, re resolving an issue, whether it's a, a property that's having an adverse impact on its uh, neighboring properties or resolving a complaint from a neighbor regarding another neighbor or mediating disputes between individuals. Um, he has had a hand in resolving a number of issues here in town, a number of issues here in town, and has also overseen the development of large projects, uh, including the um, I should say he has regulated the development of large projects, including the high school and middle school construction project and the uh, Edgewood development over by Lincoln Properties on Lowell Road. So I want to thank Mr. DeCola for his efforts and for uh, his time and his commitment to the community as well. Um, we have advertised to solicit candidates for both of these positions on the appropriate uh, municipal clearinghouse as well as the professional organizations for both of the positions. And I wish Mr. Sorgan and Mr. DeCola well in, and wish them good health in their retirements. Finally, Mr. Chairman, um, excuse me. <laughs> I should know better based on the conversation we just had. <laughs> Madam Vice Chairwoman. Um, Mr. O'Leary. Sometimes I get called Mr. O'Leary, right? You know. Um, I included a note in my town administrator's report relative to the fire department's overtime budget. Um, it's an area that we are monitoring very closely, and I know the board members receive a summary of the overtime uh, on a weekly basis. And uh, as I'm sure you've seen, we've seen an increase in activity, particularly since the end of last calendar year, beginning of this calendar year. Um, we've also gone through and we've um, uh, made payments associated with the recent settled collective bargaining agreement. Um, which uh, placed further pressure on the budget as reflected in the payroll that was processed last week. Um, as has been, been the case, um, as has been the case with other collective bargaining agreements that have been settled, any deficiency in the fire department salaries or overtime associated with a settled contract will be addressed using the salary pool at the end of the year. The salary pool is also available to address overages and overtime hours. Now, the finance director and I have developed a revised overtime protection to re reflect the trend in hours required, uh, which um, is attached, and additional financial information I committed to provide uh, the board when it was complete. So if you have your Dropbox folder open, you should see in there a document entitled BOS Packet 2 2018 Supplement, which had the information relative to Mr. DeCole and Mrs. Sorgan's retirement, as well as a spreadsheet um, that uh, the finance director prepared in conjunction with the fire chief. Um, so just to kind of briefly uh, present it, and I'm more just bringing this out for discussion in the interest of transparency. There is not a decision being asked of the board at this point in time. I'm sure there'll be a substantial discussion of this matter at the March 3rd uh, public safety budget hearing at which the fire department budget will be discussed. But you can see that uh, at this point in time, we have, um, we had a budgeted hours in that totaled 17,433 hours worth of overtime, which would have equated to $857,064 worth of cost for the fiscal year. To date, through uh, only six months and one week worth of time, we have utilized 11,074 hours worth of time. And we have spent, when you include the settled contract, uh, approximately, well, exactly $584,749 from that allocation of $857,064. Part of those payments that you, that you, and you see it down below there where it says amount due to contract settlement, are due to the contract settlement itself, which had a cumulative impact of approximately 5%. I looked to the finance director, plus the changes in some um, uh, other incentives in the contract. So that what we're trying to, to show here is that you know, there is a cost and that there are two things that are driving the challenges in the overtime budget. Um, the settled contract, which we have carried funding for in the salary pool and will address the deficiency from the salary pool. Um, I'm looking at the finance director to agree <laughs> with that statement. 
Um, and uh, also the change in hours. So if you go to the second column from the right, you'll see a revised budgeted hours recommendation, which uh, reflects a projected substantial increase at this point in time. And this is based on the actuals that we have seen for utilization, as well as transition that we are seeing in multiple positions that, are, that are, have, have taken place and will take place, creating vacancies and the need to go forward with a hiring, as well as um, the impact of all of those things, which um, right now the fire chief has identified a projected revised total budget hour projection of 20,000 545 hours, uh, which when you calculate the, um, uh, the rates required under the collective bargaining agreement result in a total cost of $1,063,987. Um, of that number, $54,033 attributable to the settled collective bargaining agreement. So uh, I bring this up to note that it's something that we have been watching closely. The finance director and I met extensively with the now retired fire chief to look at and develop an overtime projection and then we updated it with um, the provisional fire chief, Don Stats, as well. And you'll see a budget recommendation that will reflect many of these trends. Um, that said, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to go through and because of some of the reforms that were reached through collective bargaining with the fire department union, my hope is that we will be able to see reduction here. But at the moment, I cannot quantify that reduction. And so you will see a budget recommendation that reflects this, knowing that it's something we're going to be evaluating um, throughout the budget process and perhaps even into the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, I don't do any of this to sound the alarm, so to speak, but I do it in the interest of full transparency um, because I'm not sure that we've scrutinized the budget in this type of discussion, even at the budget hearings, looking retroactively in the fashion that we've done here. And I, I want to recognize both the, fire, the provisional fire chief and the finance director for their efforts on this to, to kind of weed through a lot of this information. Um, you see that we put the history there in terms of the budgeted and the actual hours. I'm sorry. Just a question. Though. Sure. You have down here this new average overtime rate of 5179. Mm -hmm. But if I take that 584,000 and divide it by the 11,000, a little over 11,000 of hours, it comes up to 52. You want me to explain? Yeah, so it's just a dollar an hour off. It's it, no, it's not that it's off. Those are actual dollars spent. So the, we know that the average overtime rate is 5179. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So when we were preparing this spreadsheet, okay. we had already put the new rates into yeah. effect, um, and we don't have a program that tracks overtime that allows us to go back and um, recreate the old rates that were in the system to when we um, put the new rates in the system. So that dollar amount reflects the average overtime rate, but the dollars in the column is the actual dollars that were paid out because it's paid out to date. So that we, you know, we, we struggle with that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's really no great scenario whether we go with the highest paid person or, you know, we go with the average. We know that it's somewhere in the middle, so, it, you highest know. highest is almost $70 or yes. maybe over $70 an hour. It's, it's about 70 And, yes. you know, uh, yes. you don't want to do that. Right. But, so, you know, there's still about 1,200 hours that burning at $70 an hour, and it's all that has to be sort of figured in. Correct. So that, that column represents actual, um, the cost of the increase for the contract is based upon the overtime, yeah. average overtime rate. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go on. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just would note that we, uh, on the, it's page 10 of the supplement, or excuse me, page 11 of the supplement. We tried to show a bit of the trend, which shows some of the volatility, vol the volatility in the, um, the budget versus the actual overtime hours. So if you were to, you know, do the comparison, and I'm going to do it, I guess, backwards. Um, fiscal year 2017, we budgeted 17,127 hours, but the actual amount of hours used was $18,319. And um, truthfully, the budget ended up effectively being balanced in that year by some uh, savings achieved by uh, not fully expending the full expenditure budget as well as, uh, was there a partial use of the salary reserve for fiscal year 17? So there was salary left from the call department yes. as well as from um, sick 
buyback, which mm -hmm. is are both salary lines that you know netted out the sure. overtime overage. If you go back to the next year before fiscal year 2016, the budget was 16,935 hours and the actual was 15,769 hours. You go back to fiscal year 2015, it was a budget of $17,349 uh, hours and the actual usage was 17,057 hours. So there is some fluctuation in this, but it appears that over the past 18 months, we've seen an overall significant increase. And when you, when you look at the timing of the way budgets are prepared, effectively the department was required to submit its fiscal year 2018 budget in December of 2016. So this is us trying to reconcile all these things together at this point in time, heading into the budget process, where again, I expect that there'll be much more extensive discussion um, relative to uh, this issue. And again, I'm not requesting any action for the board, but more just want to update the board. When someone's called in for overtime, are they going to borrow a minimum? Is that why it's so high? Uh, so I'm, I guess I can get back to you with the exact answer, but depending upon the call, the contract calls for either two or three hours. Great. Any questions? All right. Anything else in your town administrator? Uh, no, I believe that was everything. Mrs. Minupelli, would you like to start us off this evening? Sure. I just want everyone to know I recognize we're not in the 20th century. We're in the 21st century. So I knew that. Yeah, I, was, I was trying to, okay. I was being facetious. <laughs> <laughs> and just to congratulate. I thought you were joining me. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, you're in the 21st century. Um, just to congratulate our two, uh, Mrs. Rogan and Mr. DeCole. Mr. DeCola on their retirement. And that's it. Thank, thank you, select woman. Uh, I just want to thank the uh, local Cub Scouts for allowing me to be their honorary starter at the Pinewood Derby last Saturday. It kind of brought back memories and good to see all the kids and a lot of USA cars. It was really good to see. Did you play? I, I got to start the first race, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was reading from this thing, something else. Uh, I just uh, you know, want to make a comment uh, re regarding our retirees. I wish them well and uh, thank them for all their service through the years. And uh, I give the uh, town administrator uh, a lot of courage in filling those positions with people that uh, We'll do the job and uh, come up to speed as quick as possible. Uh, the, uh, I don't have the date, but uh, the uh, Friends of the Council on Aging are running their uh, town wide uh, yard sale. Yard sale. Where am I going here? And they're looking for some volunteers. So, uh, if you uh, are interested, you could call uh, my wife, Angela, at our home phone number, which is in the phone book. Thank you. Uh, again, to Mike Sargon and Jim DeCola, uh, two great public servants, and, uh, and to the administrator's point, I mean, these two gentlemen have been involved in literally thousands of projects and uh, discussions and settling, as you said, disputes. and. Uh, differences of opinion and uh, they've done yeoman's work and, and again it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to fill the positions because they uh, they know uh, they know the community uh, they know most of the characters and, uh, and that makes a big difference uh, you know Jim DeCole or two I mean as far as his, his role the working with the uh, Board of Appeals again many times his decisions are appealed to the Board of Appeals and he's actually worked with uh, you know some of the uh, People who feel aggrieved to work on some sort of a compromise and make everybody feel a little bit happier than the, when they went in. So uh, they've done a terrific job over the years and they're going to be sorely missed. But uh, again, I wish them uh, all the best and long, happy, and healthy retirement. And maybe before they leave, we can come in and, uh, and, come in and we can congratulate them publicly. I've already heard from some people who've heard the news and uh, 
they say, you're kidding me. Gonna, who's going who's gonna to follow through on this project or that project or what's going on? And so, we have a big one down the street. Yeah, okay, we've got a few big ones going <laughs> yeah. on. So, uh, a couple shovels on the ground. So, so I hope when they finally, you know, walk out the door, they don't take it with them. But, you know, but I'm sure they're going to be available to us down the road if needed. So uh, congratulations to them. Uh, other than that, Mr. Chairman, all set. Thank you. No, the, both those gentlemen are true professionals, I will say. And they certainly have left their mark on North Reading. Uh, I'm, I'm going to miss them both. I was certainly looking forward to Jim DeCola flying drones. I mean, remember that <laughs> budget meeting where he talked about it? I would have loved to see him do that but before he left, but that's unfortunate that won't happen. Right over Kate's house. Right over Kate's house. <laughs> but we wish them the very best in their retirement. They've certainly earned it. Um, I sent you all an email this week letting you know that um, Mr. Milano from Secretary Ash's office uh, I reached out to him to um, Secretary Ash, you, you know, was here about three years ago. And uh, he had asked to come back again. And so we've been working with his office to try to set up a date to do that. And he had multiple reasons for the visit. And the first one is he said he would love to follow up after he was here the, three years ago to see the board again. Uh, but he wanted to really meet Pulte Holmes. So we arranged that for. March 14th, and we're going to do that here starting around 5 o'clock. We've invited uh, Pulte to be here. We've invited Fran DeCost to be here to present the Martin's Landing project to just talk a little bit about um, how things went with the sale partnership model and kind of go through that because there really hasn't been any official, um, anybody from the official office to come in, uh, but his opportunity to meet with Pulte uh, to welcome them and uh, thank them for this project. And then after that, uh, we're going to have him come and join the EDC, where we're just going to like to get another update from our EDC on the things we've been working on. And he's going to try to help us focus, uh, maybe give us some areas of, uh, and some suggestions of areas to focus on from an economic development standpoint, uh, which everybody's welcome to stay for that. So that we start around 5 o'clock with him and Pulte Holmes. We'll do a meet and greet. He'll uh, meet with the board probably between uh, maybe at the same time or um, if we, we finish early before the 545 with EDC and then 545 with them and we're going to get him out of here. I promised uh, his office we'd get him out of here by 630. And we're going to keep him any later. So we're we posting a board meeting? With? Yes, we are. Okay. That's going to be on the 14th of March. Uh, okay. Any concerns? Any conflicts? No, just a comment, though. Happy he's coming back because, again, when he was here you know, a couple, three years ago, yeah. uh, he was very helpful with the suggestions and questioning some of our rationale. And, um, yep, and, he was. And, and, he's been, he's, and he's been extremely active. Uh, he's done a terrific job for the administration, and, uh, in particular the town of North Reading. So it would be nice to thank him again in person. Yeah, no, we're more fortunate that he has a willingness and a want to come here and uh, continue to help us grow. I think what we did with the sale partnership model and how all that worked out was a big success. And I think he wants to explore that, how he can use that model, oh, a model to absolutely. his advantage in other parts in the Commonwealth. And if we can be sort of a, his test case and his lesson learned for him, and I, and I know a lot of it, the discussion will come from that that evening. So it's a great opportunity for us. Other than that, uh, thank you for the spirit of conversation tonight. I know we don't always agree on everything, but I appreciate uh, the respect everyone gives each other as we went through the process. Well, I think we united in our efforts, which yes. has have different ideas, but um, that's okay. And then we'll leave it up to you to just guide us on what you want us to do with the end over thing. Just let us know when you come to a conclusion on the dates, okay? And uh, thank you for being flexible. Anything else? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.